articles and eight patents. He's a fellow of the INSA and is going to speak on white fly tolerant cotton for North Indian farmers. Floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Seth, for uh, introduction. I thank INSA, uh, INSA Lucknow chapter, Dr. Saman Habib, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of my research that we have been pursuing at uh, National Botanical Research Institute. Can I have my slides? So, uh, topic of my talk is uh, uh, white fly tolerant cotton for uh, North Indian farmers. So, uh, I just want to uh, create a background uh, so that everybody gets involved in the discussion and talk. So, uh, who are the most abundant on our planet? It is insects. They are uh, around 10 you know, lakh species has been recorded. And uh, so uh, I, I do not know what is happening. Yeah. So, uh, there is a global projection that uh, if you know uh, insect pest and diseases are not controlled, world is going to lose crop yield worth 540 billion US dollars, which is a huge. And uh, you know, as uh, with this recent data from FAO, around 40 percent global uh, crop yield loss is due to pest only and that happens every year. So, to control uh, pests, you use pesticides. India is, a, is not a great user of pesticides. We have a perception that we use pesticides in excess, but it is not true. So, most of the multi India ranks, you know, 10th uh, in the scale. And, uh, you know, most of the pesticide companies are pushing their products in India. They want to sell because they see India as a big market. So uh, let us talk about crop insect interaction. So we, we are dependent on around uh, 300 crops globally. The number can vary. So and then these crops are actually attacked by insects, both in the field, which is called pre-harvest condition and also during the storage that is called post-harvest condition. So human has you know improved crop for its quality and quantity, but that improvement also uh, you know encouraged insects to start you know feeding on these crops. So you know our intervention actually invariably help insect population. And it is remarkable ability of insects that they can eat, you know, wood where the water content is just 5% and they can eat a food where water content is 95%. So very high, you know, adaptability. So let us talk about cotton. So why cotton? So cotton is the third most important crop in our country after rice and wheat. It is grown on 30 million acre of land, 30 million hectare of land and cotton is sold in our country worth 1.1 lakh crore rupees. So it, is a, it has a massive impact on our economy. So uh, cotton is a very resourceful crop. So it is a fiber crop, it is an oil crop, and it is, you know, a feed crop. So when cotton is produced, around 30 percent 
of the produce is fiber. Around 28% of it is oil. And then rest is seed cake, seed cake, cake meal, which is used for uh, feeding animals, cattles. There, the protein percentage is something like 45%. So very uh, rich in proteins. So this situation actually makes you know, uh, cotton a very good host for a variety of insects. So around uh, 30 insects, uh, 61 insects have been reported, and five are falls in the pest category. So, you know, uh, if you see the, and try to understand the economy, uh, we grow cotton in, you know, 13 million acre of land, which comes around uh, 3 crore uh, acre. So, in Punjab, a good farmer actually spends around 20,000 rupees per acre on cotton and produces cotton, you know, around 20 quintal, uh, 10 quintal per acre. He spends around uh, 8,000 rupees for harvesting and then sells the produce at around uh, 60,000 rupees. The cotton price is 60 rupees a kg. So, uh, you know, the, from per acre actually they can, they get something like uh, 32,000 rupees per acre per season. But if the crop is damaged by some reasons, farmer doesn't get anything. It is notable that India ranks 37th in world in cotton productivity. So our unit area production of cotton is very, very poor. It is something like uh, 470 kg you know, per hectare, which is very, very low. Most of the African countries are better than India. So there is need to protect this crop. Uh, so that the same amount of cotton can be grown in a smaller area and the field becomes available for crop like, you know, chickpea, pigeon pea, mustard, so that uh, oil seed crops are produced in more, pulses are produced in more quantities. So we work on defense uh, uh, in cotton against the insect pest. And, uh, you, the, the one point which I have, I want to mention that 45% of the total pesticides used in our country is used only for cotton and rice. So cotton and rice are the true core crops which actually consumes huge amount of pesticide and pesticides invariably, you know, creates lot of problem. It is a soil pollution, water pollution health of farmers and many other things. So uh, now I'm coming to my topic that, you know, the, in India, cotton is damaged by a total of eight different insect pests. So uh, one insect, Helicoverpa armigera, is controlled by Bt cotton. People have a perception that Bt cotton is tolerant to all the insects. It is wrong. Monsanto never claimed, but we developed a perception that, uh, you know, Bt cotton is tolerant to uh, so many insects. So they use Cry1 AC and Cry1, Cry2AB uh, delta endotoxin genes cloned from Bacillus thuringiensis for insect defense. At uh, National Botanical Research Institute, we are trying to control, uh, we have transgenic cotton which are tolerant to pink ballworm, Pectinophora gossypiella, Spodoptera latura. These two insects are controlled with a protein, namely Cry1 EC. We are trying to control white fly with three insecticidal genes. One is TMA12, second is MSC14, and it's 34 KDA version. There is another protein, namely PNU08. We are trying to control aphid which is another insect pest of cotton, mustards, and many other crops. We are trying to control this with another protein, namely DHI31. But today's talk is focused on white fly and TMA12. So white fly is distributed all over the world. And, uh, and it, it, it hosts several 
uh, crops of horticulture, vegetable and ornamental importance other than cotton. And the cause of, uh, you know, uh, increase its population, it has become a very aggressive pest. The cause is increase in the humidity, greenhouse agriculture, high density plantation, you want to grow more plants in a small area to produce more, to get more yield. And because of this, the insects like white fly has increased. Nitrogen rich soil, ability of rapid multiplication. It is estimated that this insect alone damages crop, uh, crop yield by a value around uh, more than a billion US dollar. So what is a white fly? I'm, I'm in CDRI, I know you, you, you know mosquito and malaria more than white fly and viral diseases. So I'm just trying to compare that, you know, white, in case of mosquito, you know, female survives on human blood, it causes irritation and it spreads disease like malaria, chikungunya and dengue. White fly is also very similar for the plants. It irritates plants, feed on nutrition rich sap, uh, sap excretes a lot of honeydew. The, it takes a lot of food from the plant and excretes a lot of carbohydrates which are produced in the plants. So it is called honeydew which is very sugar rich. And then honeydew invites you know, growth of fungus on the plant and it spreads plant viral diseases. So this slide shows you know, how uh, uh, you know, white fly damages a crop and how it creates, causes spread of the viral disease in crops. This photograph shows the cloud of white fly in sub-Saharan Africa. So in 2015, uh, you know, you recall uh, cotton crop uh, in Punjab and uh, lot of crop in Pakistan got damaged because of this insect pest. So this slide shows the severity of white fly on cotton. You do not see these many mosquitoes at one place, but in cotton, uh, you get a huge amount of white flies, huge number of white flies. So in Punjab, uh, pesticides worth, you know, uh, 50 million US dollars was sprayed, but uh, crops had to be uprooted, there was no yield, and it caused, you know, uh, loss worth 47,000 crore rupees. Just in Punjab, damage happened in uh, uh, Haryana, Rajasthan, damage also happened in Pakistan, where we do not have a record, but a lot of damage has happened. And in Punjab, around 17 farmers committed suicide. It covered, it became a major, major news in 2015. So white fly cannot be controlled with the pesticide if they are colonized on a crop. Known insecticidal proteins are not efficacious to white fly. Thus GM cotton tolerant to white fly could not be developed. Plant explored diversity to address this problem. We explored, you know, plants, plant diversity to address this problem and discovered a few insecticidal proteins. So I'm very glad that I, I was, I did PhD in Lucknow and I interacted with scientists and students of CDRI and there I had learned a word activity guided purification. So, so what actually we did, uh, we got uh, several plants, right? And uh, we thought that probably one of these plants may have a protein which may be toxic to white fly. So you need to appreciate uh, one point that white fly is a crop insect. It doesn't, you know, you know feed. It, 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 it requires a very high temperature, high humidity, and it is a crop insect. So it, you know, attacks a few, you know, 200 plant species. But, you know, these, these you know, uh, these plants like ferns and mosses, they are not, you know, infested by white fly. So the idea was that how to bring, you know, plant biodiversity and white fly together to find out something interesting in plants which can control white fly. What is the strategy? The strategy was you collect, you know, uh, leaves and root of 
uh, fern and uh, mosses, mosses on the whole. So, leaf of the fern is called fronds and root is called rhizome. So, we got it, we got it from NBRI campus, we also explored Pachmali Biosphere Reserve, we prepared total soluble protein and we performed bioassay. I will talk about bioassay a little later. And then we selected a plant which cause more than, extract which cause more than 50% of mortality of white fly. Then uh, there was a question we wanted to, we were hunting a protein which can cause toxicity. So the toxicity here could be because of any other thing. So we actually treated the total soluble protein with proteinase K and we gave the thermal treatment and then performed bioassay and selected those fractions which actually where the insecticidal activity was lost due to protease activity and you know uh, thermal treatment. And then we purified the protein which is uh, toxic to white fly. So you know uh, I am just trying to explain this strategy. This is a plant and then we prepare total soluble protein and we then fractionated the protein with uh, you know ammonium sulfate. So ammonium sulfate salts out the protein differentially. We got several fractions. Now we had to test this protein against white fly. White fly is a piercing and sucking kind of insect. We prepared a diet. We mixed the protein in diet. It was sandwiched in the two layers of parafilm and then allowed you know insect to feed on this. And we found toxicity and wherever there was toxicity we took that fraction and tried to purify the protein to nearly homogeneity and it happened. So we screened around 254 plants, 11 plants were positive, showed insecticidal activity. Then from 5 plants we have purified 5 proteins which actually we are deploying for insect resistance in cotton and they are at the various stages of development. But uh, uh, TMA-12 protein was purified from a fern namely Tectoria macrodonta. This is a very, very unknown kind of fern, but it is an edible fern. It is found in Madhya Pradesh, in India and Nepal. It is consumed as a vegetable and salad. And its concoction is traditionally used for the treatment of gastric ailments. So we thought that we have isolated, a, we are going to isolate a protein, which is, you know, which have, the source plant has, we have a history of using source plant as a food. So we are very confident that probably whatever we, uh, the protein we get, that will get regulatory clearance faster. So let us talk about how we could purify the protein. When I'm, uh, Talking, I am remembering Dr. Virod Bhakuni, late Dr. Virod Bhakuni, who taught me the tips of uh, protein purification. So uh, we prepared uh, total soluble protein from uh, rhizome and leaf, and we found activities in both. So we thought that let us actually target purification of the protein from leaves only. And then we performed ammonium sulfate precipitation. And we found that the maximum activity, insecticidal activity, was in uh, 60 to 80 percent fraction. We took this fraction and we started optimizing ion exchange chromatography and we could purify this protein as a single peak with almost 85 percent homogeneity. Reaching to this level was very, you know, uh, difficult. So uh, we call this protein TMA-12. TMA, T comes, T denotes uh, tacteria, MA, macrodonta, and then uh, 12 means we have attempted a total of 12 times to optimize this protocol. So it is called TMA-12. So we purified to nearly homogeneity. So all the proteins here was very beautifully, you know, fractionated and we got this fraction. And then we purified the protein to homogeneity on size exclusion chromatography. Then uh, we, we characterized this protein. This protein was toxic to white fly at, uh, you know, LC50 was 
1.49 microgram per ml. Uh, this protein has a single isoform and it exists as a dimer. Uh, but you know, you cannot produce a recombinant protein in a such a high level in plants like cotton. So at sub-lethal doses like 100 nanogram per ml, this protein interferes in the reproductive cycle of the insect. And it is exclusively toxic to whitefly. It is not toxic to any other insect. Now we got this protein. Uh, we got this protein to uh, this level of purity. Now we do not know what is this protein. So what actually we did? We did protein sequencing on maldi -taftof. So what is the beauty of the system? So if you take peptides of a protein and you fragment from both the ends, you get a very messy data. The fragmentation happens uh, from the end terminus and also from the C terminus. N terminus generates B ion and C terminus generates Y ions and actually they make the data very complicated. So what actually we did, we blocked all the ions with SPITC chemistry, so only Y ions were allowed to enter in the time of top tube and we get the clean data and with this we could resolve some of the peptide sequences of the protein. And then we clone them. So uh, this gene is uh, 209 base pair long and it encodes for an open reading frame of 651 amino acid residue. Uh, it is, uh, it encodes, uh, six, it, it is 651 uh, base pair long. It encodes a protein of 216 amino acid residue. The, pro pre, the uh, precursor protein is transported to endoplasmic reticulum. A signal peptide of 24 amino acid is cleaved and 192 am amino acid mature protein is produced in the plant, which is toxic to the plant. But why this protein is produced in plant, we do not know. Then what is this protein? So we wanted to know that because the protein is quite unknown and it is toxic to whitefly, but it was important to know the structure of protein. So actually, I collaborated with Dr. Prema Vasudev in CSIR CMAP, and she crystallized this protein and established this as a lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase. So this is a structure of polysaccharide monooxygenase, and uh, it has two intramolecular disulfide bond. It forms a histidine brace-like structure with the N terminus, and it engages a copper atom to uh, make uh, the protein stable. The protein can be characterized as a histidine base and it has a glycosyl unit. This experiment was published in Planta in 2019. So when we published our work, uh, transgenic work in uh, nature biotechnology, there was a group of a consortium of scientists uh, in US and in Europe, they actually hypothesize that the gene cloned at NBRI has migrated from bacteria to the fern through horizontal gene transfer. Somehow, you know, uh, we do not agree with this hypothesis and we are working on it. However, at present the hypothesis is that the gene has migrated from bacteria or fungus to this fern, Tactidia macrodonta. We do not know the function of this gene and protein in the fern. What is very interesting that uh, despite of you know very low homology like 30 you know percent, the three-dimensional structure of TMA12 and bacterial lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase is quite superimposable. Uh, I would like to inform you that this is a very very important enzyme with the industry perspective because it is used in digestion of complex carbohydrates to make alcohol. Now actually uh, we move, so we, we got the gene, we got a promoter from Arabidopsis, we develop a construct and we introduce the gene expression cassette in cotton. 
so when you introduce the gene expression cassette in cotton it means the gene should have its own promoter coding region and uh, terminator which is a very suitable for cotton so we did this so we developed transgenic cotton that is the the, the cotton is called genetically modified cotton or transgenic cotton so we used we had used several promoters to express this protein we developed several lines and finally we selected four lines which actually showed quite high level of tolerance to insect pests so this photograph shows that the non gm cotton which is fully covered with white fly and gm cotton uh, was quite tolerant and white fly could not multiply on it so you can see you know x and nymphs on uh, non gm cotton uh, and it was very very you know small in number on gm cotton so the production of protection of cotton from white fly small in number on gm cotton to so the production of protection of cotton from white fly actually enabled cotton to produce good amount of cotton balls so you can see it here so uh, we analyzed several we got several plants and then we studied uh, transcript level and we found a few lines with a very high level of transcript these lines were tested for production of tma12 in cotton so it was analyzed by immunoblot analysis and then we you know performed a trial of gm cotton we challenged with white fly and we found that the plant that express protein at a very high level had lowest count of white fly and the plant which did not produce uh, tma12 in good amount the the white fly count was higher and control cotton had lot of white fly as you have seen in the photograph we took this plant to poly house and so white fly is a vector of viral diseases so the idea is if you want to control malaria you control uh, a mosquito so if you want to control viral disease in plants you control white fly viral disease will be automatically controlled so here we have grown you know transgenic cotton and control cotton challenge with virulent white flies we found that uh, transgenic cotton is absolutely normal and then you see you know the curling of leaves in cotton and this is the, these are the symptoms of viral diseases in cotton so when virus infection happens cotton plant becomes photosynthetically very active and then uh, it it start it in is it enters in the next cycle of plant and does not produce cotton balls which is required by the farmer so we tested uh, gm cotton presence of uh, viral particles in control and transgenic cotton we found that uh, viral dna was present in control cotton with its alpha and beta satellite dna which was absent in uh, you know uh, gm cotton so this shows that you know another trial where either plant in case of non gm cotton most of the plants died because of white fly predation and fungal growth the plants which survive got infected with viral disease and you know enter uh, in a new cycle and started photosynthesis on the other hand gm cotton actually produced good amount of balls which actually you can see in the photograph so this is another uh, you know uh, trial between the you know a low expressing gm cotton and high expressing tma12 tma12 expressing gm cotton very good yield we uh, you know recorded in comparison to low expressing lines and finally these are the two lines which we shared with punjab agriculture university ludhiana and uh, cicr nagpur for independent unbiased evaluation so uh, the evaluation is under progress and in next year this is the last year trial next year they will take a call to deploy this uh, cotton for a variety development so it is very important that uh, when you introduce a gene in uh, cotton 
or any transgenic plant, you need to inform RCGM where the gene has gone. So, uh, in for example, in event 402, uh, this gene has gone in a chromosome. Cotton is a tetraploid uh, genome, and it has got in chromosome D08. So, when a, a, a you know gene enters in a in 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 a genome, a part of DNA is of the genome is deleted. It is possible that new sequence is also inserted there, and it is possible that the part of your DNA which you want to insert in cotton in a crop that is also deleted. So we did all these analysis, and we found that our you know these events do not. We also need to know that when you introduce a gene in crop, it should not disturb any functional gene of the host plant. So we did not find any you know uh, uh, you know uh, disruption of a functional gene of cotton. And so when you introduce a gene in a crop, you also try to see that the insertion did not create uh, an ORF which can produce a protein which is allergenic. So we did not find any such protein. So we found that this plant, these, these events are quite safe and we can use it for uh, a variety development. Not saying it's uh, time to conclude. I'm just concluding. It. Yeah. So then I interacted again with uh, CDRI and we performed a safety study with uh, CDRI and we actually uh, we learned that uh, GM cotton, you know, uh, the cotton seed cake meal is fit fed to the calves. So around uh, 450 gram of uh, seed cake meal is given to calf. So the equivalent protein was fed to uh, rat, and we found that the protein has no bad effect on the treated rat. So uh, now, actually, so you have we have introduced the gene in Cocker 312 variety of cotton, but it is not a cultivated variety. It is an American cotton. We now we have introduced the gene. In a popular variety of uh, Punjab, Haryana, and Rajasthan, which is F2228. So the back crossing is under progress, and maybe in one year or so, the variety will be developed. So, with this, actually, I am concluding that uh, a white fly toxic protein was isolated, and it happened to be a lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase. It is very insect specific, it does not cause any problem. When you know uh, uh, when we fed the protein to uh, rat, and uh, we hope that at some point of time this uh, technology will be used by the farmers of country. So how it will be used? So it will be used like uh, you know that the BT cotton, and then we have a cotton which is we call it as a Cry1 EC cotton, and then this. TMA12 cotton I talked about, if we stack all three events in cotton, the three gene cotton will be tolerant to uh, four, uh, five different insects. And we are running this project under a cotton mission. This is plant molecular biology, plant physiology team of NDRI. And I thank you very much for patient hearing. These are my collaborators. CDRI, I thank uh, Smriti, Vahaj Bhai, Tarika and Sharad Bhai for you know conducting uh, testing the protein for its safety and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. I think we are running out of the time, but there's still if anybody has a burning question, one question. So. Uh, uh, we could not take it up uh, properly. So when this plant will go in deregulatory procedure, all such things will be tested. So I do not know the subject. Actually, it is all the team CDRI who actually designed the experiment. And then they performed uh, some experiments with it. I, I, I understand question and I had faced this question earlier also. Uh, but uh, we could not do it, uh, but it will be taken up. 
in a proper manner. Okay. Uh, Dr. Singh, thank you so much. No, the calf is an example. So how, how, may, how much protein we should test against the rat? For that, actually, we, we, got, we took that as an example to calculate the dose. Uh, but in future, when the detailed uh, deregulatory procedure will start, all these things will happen. When, then GM seeds will be used for treating the feeding uh, calves. No, they are. They were not fed with the seeds. The coughs are. Not, it is a rat for how much protein to be fed to the rats. We you, we use that data, you know, for calculation of the dose. Okay. People talk about developing resistance against, you know, BT cotton, right? It has remained as a myth. BT cotton, you know, is good for 20 years. So insect had to engineer itself a lot to develop resistance against a protein, right? It can develop resistance against pesticide because that, that biology is different. But if you, you know, ask insect to develop resistance against a protein, not so easy. Okay, I think uh, there may be questions, but they can be raised during the lunch time. So, Dr. Singh, I have uh, one. That was, first of all, thank you so much for really painstaking and passion you had to obtain the protein, purify it, clone it, and then finally inserted it and made it. I have one uh, curiosity that we had a BT cotton. Now we will have this cotton against the fly. Now, is it possible to have one cotton variety having uh, different genes, theoretically? Sir, uh, it, is, it, is, it is my dream that I should be able to delete around uh, 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 100 kilo base pair uh, DNA from the cotton genome and stack uh, five genes there to create a locus for insect resistance using, you know, the CRISPR technology. So we are working on it. It is, uh, you know, too early to, to make any comment. Yes. But, but it is an aim. It is possible that I may retire, but, you know, somebody in my laboratory should do it. Good. It's possible. Thank you so much. And I thank uh, organizers for giving an opportunity to share this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Said, for chairing this session um, and to both the speakers for very interesting talks. We will now uh, take a short break for tea outside. I think the light has come back, so when we come back to this audience, it should be cooler. Uh, <laughs> so just a short break, 10-minute break for tea outside. Please join us, everybody.
हेलो 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 संतोष सर हेलो So welcome back to the second session. Uh, this session is to be chaired by Dr. Madhu Dixit. Uh, Ma'am, please come up on the dais. We have three.
to the auditorium after a very, very interesting session in the morning. And I feel it is uh, late for good morning and a bit early for afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in this uh, session, there are uh, three speakers, as someone has already pointed out. So uh, without wasting any time, I will invite Professor Harshwardhan Vanare. He is from Department of Physics and the Center for Lasers and Photonics at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. His interests range from classical to quantum aspects of light matter interaction. After receiving his PhD from the University of Hyderabad, where he pursued the study of varied aspects of coherent light matter interaction, he joined the Washington State University USA for a postdoctoral fellowship on semiconductor optics. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at Illinois State University, where he worked on light propagation in random media. He joined IIT Kanpur in the year 2000. He has published in the areas of coherent control of light matter interaction, quantum optics, nonlinear optics, metamaterials, anisotropic media photonic band gap materials, light propagation in random media, and biomedical optics. His current research interests range from quantum and classical aspects of orbital angular momentum states of light, control of pulse shaping, and propagation in structure media, imaging to create effective optics-based solutions for biomedical diagnostics. So I request to initiate your talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this amazing opportunity. Uh, and I feel completely out of place simply because uh, you guys are looking at single amino acids connecting large DNAs and doing amazing things. I don't do any of this sort. We are looking at everything as a small unit and hope it works. So uh, physicists in the wrong place, but bear with me for the next half an hour. And uh, this is the title of my talk. <clears throat> yeah, so life and sustainable life. I tried to connect the two. And uh, my original idea was light and life, but then uh, Dr. Habib said sustainable life would sound better. And hence I have taken that route. Uh, I hope you doesn't change uh, which Ah, it does. Okay, there's a time lag. Fantastic. So this is the these are the sustainable goals, right? And probably I will touch upon not really uh, anything deeply, but about eight to nine of these. And I I will uh, stay true hopefully to the basic premise, which is basic sciences and sustainable development. For I will we will see how we go about doing that, right? So uh, this is a supposedly a light talk. So I'll start with photosynthesis. I will try to connect all of these topics which seem unrelated at the end of it. So if you give me enough time, I will conclude my talk. But before that, please do not. <laughs> anyway, that's a request. Uh, I look at eye, I look at light, it's aspects, a few of them which are relevant to my uh, this thing. And this is the main idea that I want to focus on regarding sustainability. And you know, one can literally use uh, the universe and the earth as a thermodynamic engine uh, and hopefully do something uh, useful passively, right? And uh, the, way, the way forward uh, um, is essentially hoping to mimic nature and probably that's the way forward. So this is what is the, the whole uh, sequence and I hope I can convey some meaningful things. All right, so light is the source of literally all life on Earth, right? And uh, uh, I will uh, probably dwell on one particular aspect that nature does variety of things in an extremely efficient manner. And we need to pick up those aspects of efficiency and put down in simple systems so that we can uh, probably perform better. And uh, uh, as very rightly pointed out in the morning, I mean, the way we are uh, destroying the earth in terms of uh, its resources, I think uh, we need to learn from nature how to sort of sustain 
itself and uh, you know a, in a sustainable manner all right so all right okay so there is a delay and i need to probably point it in a particular direction oh boy yes sorry all right so for example the green color right so you know the green color arises because of uh, selective absorption so largely there are variety of photosynthetic uh, photoactive uh, molecules in a leaf right and it's chlorophyll that basically you know gives this green color so what it does is basically absorbs uh, light in the bluish region this is about 400 nanometers or 0.4 microns if you want to think about it and also in the red right it absorbs these parts so that what is remaining is the green part and that's how we look at uh, we see green color on the leaves right so the question one is asking is the following you know if you look at nature and uh, it appears as though there is a lot of greenery around right so is nature over indulgent when it comes to greens right it appears as though nature is overdoing it and uh, i want to convey to you that it is not really so let us get to some uh, interesting uh, the mechanism so basically you know there are i don't want to tell to the audience which is specialist in biology there are these chloroplasts where there are chlorophyll molecules stacked in this disks and so on so this where the the conversion of light uh, happens uh, and the typical concentrations of uh, chlorophyll in leaf is about 400 micro moles per meter square uh, correct me if this number is wrong but this is an average number so if you think about it you convert this moles into molecules it's about 10 to 20 molecules per meter square which is there in a leaf right so what do we compare this with we compare this with the typical solar flux the solar flux can vary from 1400 watts per meter square very bright light to average 700 watts per meter square and then you calculate the number of photons per unit area which you can do a very simple calculation go by this formula you will see is about 10 to the power of 21 photons per meter square you see the matching between chlorophyll molecules and 10 to the power of 21 photons that's absolutely amazing now let me tell you why this is important i am a quantum optics person i look at something called the quantum aspects of light what it means is that um for example the motivation for learning quantum optics is that the light we see is not really continuous so if you put a detector and you know you lower down the light it will go tick 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 and so on and so forth it is actually quanta quanta by quanta and we perceive it as a continuous light so question one asks is when is it as i said you know tone down the light decrease amount of intensity then you see quanta that's not the point at the very basic uh, life level every photon matters this is one to one correspondence between photon availability of photon availability of the chlorophyll and all that stuff right photosynthesis efficiency is known to be 30% for making the glucose i'm sure the tree does a lot more i just came to know from the previous talk that tree does a lot more to protect itself but then if you look at that efficiency is 30% but there are about 23 steps which are happening which need to happen at 95% efficiency to get to that number of 30%. So please understand that it is not there is nothing wasteful about nature it is just right. This is one aspect. So let me now change gears and and just tell you that you know this stuff is really true you know I heard of something called the young's double slit experiment you put light through your learning in the school i probably hated it uh, but what you can do the same is that to put through the young's double slit experiment this very low light levels where you think quanta is important in the interferometer this is the interferometer through which light goes through it has a path to choose left or right but in this interferometer it actually one photon at a time it doesn't know the other one is are arriving and you see that the photons form this individual photons if you collect and keep their history you will see this interference pattern right so that is essentially the nature of the very quantum aspect of light and that is very important it's important even for sustaining life on earth right yeah and then you know we we worry about other things we worry about statistics for example how are the photons arriving if you look at a light like this the photons come in bunches if you look at atoms 
single atoms emitting light they never come together then if you look at a light from a laser which is like this then that's the top one it comes they come randomly and so on and so forth some details which i don't want to get into not relevant at the moment so i switch my gears and go to i right and i'm sure you know more biology than me so i will not belabor the point this is a familiar curve i a uh, familiar uh, sort of schematic uh, i'm interested in the retina by the way also the lens of course so i'm looking at it as a physics problem right um so what you have is amazing a uh, detector so by the way we are not able to mimic the eye when it comes to detectors in real science uh, i mean real science in the sense that the science that we do in laboratory so for example you know our eyes work fantastic outside inside the dark adjusted eye by the way can detect roughly a photon flux of 5 photons per second that's survival you understand so even as little as a 5 photon per second will be a dream detector for a single photon detector manufacturer and our eyes do it simply every night when you shut off the lights right when you see this you know you have the feeling you're walking that you have somebody following you it's probably nothing sixth sense it is just eye measuring a very highly uh, a single photon probably falling from a very large angle and you think that you have you know probably somebody behind so that's survival and light uh, and eye does it beautifully i want to get to some other number so apart from this which you know that we make a inverted image optics wise but our head that allows it to turn it around and by the way people have done experiments where you continue to have a inverted image and then within 20 minutes you know our brain adapts to behaving the way it is right so brain is an amazing beast there so let's not get there so anyway there are three particular types of so there are rods and cones i'm sure you know the story there are cones of three different types uh, blue green and red a uh, relative firing of these tells you these other subtle colors that we make so the color i see the color you see you remember that big debate in um, on the internet that blue dress or um, the golden dress it is got to do with your eye okay it's so you it's your dress uh, so anyway so there are these light sensitive photoreceptors um so uh, uh, literally if you come to uh, so the, let me get to the detail so there are these cones and rods as i said the cones are largely uh, centered at this region called the fovea right just behind the lens so where cones are responsible for color one doesn't want to do color when you're surviving in a forest late dark in the night you want to appreciate color when you're lighted up so it's roughly there and then rods are everywhere rods are the sensitive ones which are sort of color immune color immune they they do have a response but then they are more sensitive than the cones and uh, they are spread all over the eye right and you know there are these uh, this itself is a fantastic step from light falling here all the way to detect it there how is it happening right so that is another story at the end of it you know you require a lot of blood in the back of the retina so that light photons don't bounce around in the retina so that you get blurred images it needs to absorb it so it's just an amazing amazing absolutely perfect device for detection now so the difference between owl eye and our eye owl sees better is only that they have a much larger retina double the size okay and because they have a larger retina and they want to actually figure out which way the photon is coming they turn the heads beautifully right so zero in okay so now that i come to eye i want to just get aside to imaging what is the imaging imaging is a place where if you want to get a nobel prize work work in this area nobel prizes are peppered all over the place so i will not belabor this you guys use the microscopy all the time what is the main issue issue is the following i have a object and physicists are extremely lazy people they actually draw arrow to show a lens by the way huh? so this is a lens i believe uh, so we have a object and we form a image what is the image it's a point to point mapping from the object to the image so what i want to do is i want to make i want to make a image of that point back there right so it so happens because of my finiteness of my system i will basically map a point i have exaggerated here into a disk okay this is called a point spread function and this size of the disk depends on the wavelength of light okay and also the aperture size of your lens so bigger the lens you know finer the point would be right 
look at the angular size of the disk and uh, it depends on the wavelength. The larger the wavelength, the worse is. Blue light you will see slightly better than what you would see in red light. So this is the point spread function and the resolution. That is if I take two points, because if the points are mapped to disks, the disks are overlapping. So now you're asking, can I resolve these two points? Would be that, can I resolve these two disks as independent? That's the job of the eye, right? And nature does it beautifully. So I will not get into this. You can do better than the resolution. I thought this is a physics talk. I will not get into details. But if somebody has a question, I will tell you how this works. But apart from that, what you want to do is you want to, basically that disk is lambda square, you know, by D. You want to make it better than lambda square. Can you pinpoint? Yeah, you can do better. That's on the point. Let's get back to the eye. So look at the sizes of these rods and cones. You know, this is a SEM image. I don't know why one would do that, but we take an image and we find out the size of it. And this is two micron square. Okay, that's a disk. I'm talking on the top there, not again the length of it. The detector is the is the surface, for example. And look at uh, so I calculate the delta theta, which is the point spread function's uh, you know angular size. That's about 1.64 10 power minus 4 radians. This is in units of you know uh, degrees radians. So this is radians. So if you look at the size of the disk, is basically 20 mm is the size of typical eye. So this is 3.4 micrometer, 2 micrometer, 3.4 micrometer square. You see the matching, amazing matching. And by the way, this is for 4 mm. Our eye, uh, the iris, you know, which controls the amount of aperture size, like in a camera, it goes from 2 mm to all the way to 8 mm. So there is some adaptation. So this is just a qualitative number, but look at this matching. There's no point putting more pixels. It doesn't, it's wasteful. Nature does it beautifully. You can't have very large eyes, so it's adapted to that size. All right, so now I'll come to a few other of light, which is color. Uh, so, uh, so I'm interested in all these frequencies, wavelengths. This is something I picked up from the, the internet. I'm sure you can have a look at it. We are looking at visible here, right? That's what I talked about till now. And I will look at something called in the mid infrared. All right, I'll talk about it slightly later. But then that's the region where you know. So variety of sizes. The way we think about light is you know okay. Um, when we were in school, light was in rays. When we were in 12th standard, it became a wave. When we came back to BSc, then it became a sort of wave with much more complication. And then we made to masters. They said no, no. Actually, it's a particle, a photon. And then we get there and we say actually nobody understands. Don't worry about it. It's both, it's both, uh, you know, particle and wave, and we are happy. Nature doesn't like to distinguish. We are stuck in our heads, so we like to distinguish and so on. So that's one aspect of light, which is the color, the frequency, the energy carried by the photon. It's very important. So, uh, for example, if you had, uh, if you had the planets away from sun, the colors of leaves might have been different. Just the way we, look. Uh, it would have been darker plants if you're a little further away. Uh, because then you'll have to utilize that you're and so on. So uh, polarization is another aspect of light, which is what makes it uh, 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 um, vectorial uh, aspect of light. So you can have a linearly polarized light where the electric field is going like a circle, there's circularly polarized light and combinations of thereof. And you can see all this in these glasses that one makes, Ray-Ban glasses, you've seen that. So for example, you have a trough of water where you have got light falling in from the sun, and then you have stones underneath, right? And you see that at reflection, the light basically, one polarization reflects differently from other polarization. So you see that one can basically put a Ray-Ban glass like polarizer cutoff thing and you can see light coming from inside. Now this is not a trivial example, by the way, Raman figured out that uh, the ocean is blue because of this experiment doing on the ship. See, that is what makes us different from him. He was traveling in a ship, he had nothing to do, so he was carrying a lot of optics in his pocket. He was an expert, world expert in acoustics, but he was carrying stuff for the optics. He figured out why the sky is blue and then went on to do a lot of optics. That was the beginning, and that this is the experiment he performed. That's another story. All right, so this is my most important side. I'm coming to now Earth as a, um, as a thermodynamic engine. So these are, I uh, know, 2012, this was published in the IPCC report, and this is what tells you 
how earth functions in the end we are living in comfortable temperatures uh, not to but otherwise 300 kelvin more or less earth remains more or less stationary how is it possible right so what you have is just look at these numbers uh, sorry to be detailed but then the point is in the numbers so 341 watts per meter square so these numbers are all watts per meter square coming in from about 79 watts gets you know uh, what beta square gets reflected from uh, clouds another 23 from the surface so you see that about one third of it is just gone away by reflection reflection okay uh, 161 is absorbed about 78 the equal amount that is reflected is with the atmosphere right so your atmosphere that is taking away this energy what does atmosphere do so every object at a temperature t finite radiates energy this is called the stefan boltzmann law at some sigma t to the power of 4 so everything that is at a finite temperature radiates it has got a characteristic radiation pattern by the way we thought we understood physics and systems very well uh, pre 1900 planck figured out this law because this was not explained otherwise hotter things were looking more bluish radiation so on so that is a different story but every object at temperature t emits radiation right fine so um, sun is at 5000 and odd kelvin so it emits now we have got energy which is stuck in the atmosphere right it falls on the earth by the way uh, there is evaporation happening there are thermals happening but this is the energy that is circulated back and forth so there is nothing to talk about as an overall engine and then you see that you have the surface radiation which is going out some of it getting absorbed again and these greenhouses are reflecting back so we, uh, be careful because the atmosphere is getting not only from the sun it is also getting from the earth so it's emitting everywhere both sides top and bottom at the end you add up these numbers 239 goes out there 102 goes out there and add up these is 341 actually it is if you put the numbers right it's about 0.9 watts per meter square is remaining with earth okay 0.9 watts per meter square that's the amount which is remaining leading to sort of heating or whatever right now that we know this i am interested in this you know there is this 22 watt per meter square which seem to go from the surface of earth all the way out without as though looking at the atmosphere okay and that's something which i want to focus on as i go along so this is the solar spectrum i'll try to be as pictorial as possible so this i said this is the typical theoretical curve as described by planck you know you're so good and that matches with the sun's you know spectrum at 5250 degree celsius and you know by the time this is the the yellow thing is on the top of the atmosphere by the time you come down then a lot of these gases are taken away some light so what you get is this red curve with a lot of dips and all that each of these dips correspond to absorption by that particular species now it so happens that nitrogen and oxygen are abundant but they don't participate in this part too much okay so now you are looking at of course the numbers you see is largely the radiation is confined from 250 nanometers to 2500 or in my words it is 0.25 microns to 2.5 microns that's the range in which solar influx is coming right so people talk about energy light based energy i will not touch into any of this not interested i mean i am not interested at the moment for the talk but very very important clean energy does hell a lot we should have done this earlier uh, but the manner in which we are doing also is not uh, you know the other issues with probably venkatesh i will leave it to him for to discuss how we are doing it badly so anyway so i am looking at something called radiative sky cooling i hope i have 15 thank you okay so this is the this is so this is the main slide so i have this input radiation that is coming in this red one is input radiation of course that is coming in and this much is falling on earth but what earth does is it takes away this radiant energy converts into heat and then it's emitting it back so it so happens that there are there are of course various gases for example water vapor you see it is it is absorbing all over the place you know? and then carbon dioxide this is this is in wavelength scale so from 0.2 microns you see that 0.2 or let's say one somewhere this here is about roughly about 0.35 or 0.4 microns all the way to 2.5 microns that is where this is right this is where the input is coming from and this part is the one which is the outgoing thermal part now why do i say it's outgoing 
because you see that if you look at a like said that if you have a typical temperature t an object it will emit radiation characteristic to that temperature it is nothing to do with the material it's got to do with the temperature so we are roughly at 300 kelvin and that that black body bell shaped curve at peaks in this infrared region is called a mid infrared and it basically peaks between 8 to 13 micrometers okay very very important and it so happens that there are very few that actually contribute to absorption there okay so this is the breathing mode of the earth which is trying to give out their energy and keep itself reasonable is that okay that's very very important so you see uh, now by the way all these gases they are very very important for example the ozone takes care of the uv so you know we don't get that then uh, rayleigh scattering largely happens here and so on so if you look at the total absorption and scattering from the atmosphere you see this little window where there is little happening there of course it is compromised so you see why people are harping about carbon dioxide is because carbon dioxide has a little remnant there in that 8 to 13 micrometer window right that's a window for earth to cool directly and that window if you play around with you are going to temperature of earth so you see carbon dioxide limits it there is a little bit of ozone which is by the way very little it's uh, up there and then uh, a lot of water so if you have a very cloudy situation very uh, rather very humid situation in that case you won't cool as efficiently all right so now that now this is the distribution of the greenhouse gases as i said nitrogen and oxygen largely transparent in the discussion that we are have all right so now that we know we know this business what is the business we are incoming here this is a visible window right point 3 now relevant window because we are not looking at top of the atmosphere looking at on earth point 3 microns to about 1 or 2 let's say that's a incoming solar flux and this is atmospheric window where nobody in the atmosphere participates apart from ozone which is little far away and too little to bother us too much right so typical thermal systems are these we have been doing this all the time take the solar energy in you know convert that into heat use that heat for some output there is some remnant here there is convective thing this is a radiation coming in and so on there is some infrared emission and so on this is what we usually do we want to convert this systems which are essentially in terms of units same set but need to operate very differently what i want is i want radiative cooling that is i want a radiator that will not take this energy right it will emit a lot of it in this range because nobody else is picking up in the atmosphere and you know the reservoir system and that that cool part will be used for comfort right and so on so this is precisely what i i intend to do and let's see how to go about doing now this little bit of mathematics just to make things right i cannot see if i uh, i don't do it too well without the signs being correct so this is the radiative part which is what i want to radiate out atmosphere is putting in energy into my surface solar is directly coming in atmosphere is putting in there is a non radiative there is convection and uh, conduction that is happening there is and i have this body at let's say ambient temperature is 300 kelvin and out there is the universe which is at 3 kelvin temperature so by the way the cosmic microwave background radiation is at 3 kelvin we know that we have measured that so you see you are looking at if you look at 300 kelvin to the power of 4 right 10 to of 8 and this some trivial number so it's a very large amount of difference when you are looking at radiative cooling then another equation just bear with me so if you look at any object right it can transmit light it can reflect light it can absorb light okay so this transmittance reflectance and absorptance they all add up to one nothing else can do so and it so happens that the amount you absorb is the same amount you emit this is by kirchhoff very very important so it is counterintuitive that i need to absorb as much to emit as well okay send this not easy but that's why kirchhoff's name is there and it so happens that the amount of light which is radiated it depends as i said so i have a object which is a temperature t object it is radiating there is a other ambient which is radiating back so you see that the 
effective radiation is just this, right? That is, what we are talking about is this ambient for a problem being in comparison to uh, the 300 Kelvin that we have. All right. So uh, this is the area that I work on metamaterials, but then and I have never really worked on this pure thermal emitters per se. I should confess. But then after preparing for this talk, I am leaning towards that side. Yeah. So what you want is solar influx. You want to reflect it off. That's from 0.3 to 3 microns. You don't want anything to do with it. So it doesn't even absorb. And then thermal radiator I want from 8 to 13. That means I want to make this material, which is extremely emissive from 8 to 13 or absorptive 8 to 13 and extremely reflective between 0.3 to point. That's my input. That's my output. Rest of the spectrum, I don't care, right? So, and have people done this? So, metamaterials is what we talk about. So, let me just tell you a little bit about it. So, a material's response to light, I'll take uh, five minutes. If it's okay. Yeah. Ah, so, material's response depends on permittivity and permeability. That is the response to electric and magnetic fields. And uh, earlier, these were God given, but then, you know, some people thought that you can do better and we can actually change them around, even change the uh, sign of the refractive index and so on and so forth. These are called meta materials, which are, which are available naturally in, in nature. So uh, the deal is this, um, again, apologies for being pedantic. So there is this Maxwell's equation, these epsilon and mu are actually coefficients that determine how we interact. We can change the signs of these in a very funny way. For example, energy is propagating. So wave is going, the wave falls and the energy flows in the same direction. Typically, but we can turn around things and you know make things quite funny. But this is the reg regime of meta material. Let me just tell you how you do it. So, for example, you look at permittivity. For example, in a metal, a metal will largely reflect light, but you can also make the metal transparent. So, what it does is the reflection, the amount of light. If you are know this is a complex number, but in omega is sort of you know above a certain frequency, which is omega p. This becomes like a dielectric. Below that, it becomes like a heavy reflector. So what you can do is you can change the number density of electrons by taking a material and taking thin wires. So these wires are sizes which are much smaller than the wavelength of light. So the wave sees only an average material. That's what is the whole notion of metamaterial. Similarly, for example, there are no magnetic influences beyond gigahertz in usually uh, God-given materials, but we can make uh, magnetic resonances for example, where we, we take a material, make these little rings, which acts like a, a L and a C capacitive gap and C resonance, and this can be made to sort of hertz and so on. So one can uh, play around and change these properties so that one can have epsilon and mu as one likes. So this is something that in microwave, in optical, depending on the scale, you know, one does various things. These are just two cold uh, bars put in a particular direction for a particular polarization of light, this will give you the characteristics that, oh, sorry. Uh, so for example, this is something that we did, which is to make a metal uh, transparent and so, and so forth. Let me not get into that. Let me come to the main point. So radiative sky cooling again. So what people have done is the following. You know, people have taken these stacks of materials, okay, such a way that they have got very the, the characteristics that you want. You want emission at 8 to 13, and you want complete reflection at. And you see that many of them are triangles, and I'll tell you why. Uh, many of them are triangles, which are and these have been shown. What is most interesting is, is daytime sky cooling. I'm talking about daytime sky cooling. People have got temperatures below the ambient to about 5, 10, 25 degrees Celsius. That's absolutely amazing. All that you have done is you have kept structure, which is reasonably well engineered. That's it. And it just cools down. We are talking about daytime sunlight. And this will, so for example, this is just a polymer film on which there are these transparent glass balls, silicon dioxide balls for particular size. Okay. Uh, some amazing work going on in this direction. So, the way forward is biomimicry. I'll just take last one slide. There are these sarin silver ants, you know, they are very smart. So they survive in direct sunlight, do it very well. 
and bingo, what they use is the hair on their skin. And you know, they have got a particular profile, which is triangular. And it so happens that if you look at their, you know, and all over the visible, they kind of reflect. These guys have actually removed hair from the sample and with hair and done experiments, something cruel. I don't want to worry about that. But you know, the hair that sort of makes it completely reflective. And in the mid infrared, look at this transition point with the hair. You see that between 8 to 13, it actually uses the atmospheric window to cool itself. Right? Probably nature knows best. And hopefully, I have put in these all aspects together. We need the efficiency of photosynthesis, the scale accuracy of the eye, integrate all the aspects of light from color, polarization, maybe quantum aspects. And then, you know, use this Earth universe system as a passive cooling mechanism. And by the way, uh, the amount of energy used for cooling uh, in the West is uh, about 60 percent in the US goes for maintaining buildings, 80 percent in, in Europe. So you understand that this is and we require to cool. I mean, as we know today. And way forward is probably biomimicry. And it is not just one place. It's not just Saharan silk, silk insect, uh, silk ant. What did I say? Saharan silver ant. There are other species that do this uh, with great elan. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. You are not, I think. You have to press, yeah. No, but it is not working. It is working now? Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Harshwardhan, for yeah. your very interesting talk. You have touched upon various topics within a short span of time. Yeah. And uh, if there is any question from the audience. Yeah, Dr. Singh, yes. Absolutely. People are looking at paints, by the way. Apply that paint, and uh, you know you will cool immensely. Yes. That is correct. That is correct. Why? Automatically. So automatically, it so happens that. We are terrestrial. So terrestrial temperatures, there is, so even if you cool, for example, I cool other wavelengths, the atmosphere will give that back to like whatever I on me. So the 300 Kelvin is there, but there is window of opportunity, which is that atmospheric window where if you emit, atmosphere is not participating in that, in that, uh, you know, top. It is not stopping it. It is not absorbing. There is no more. Of course, if you have a extreme sort of, uh, you know, compromised. Yeah. That, no, really, see, see, I mean, we all. Participate in these. Nitrous oxide does. Oh, no. So, okay. So, we are people. What we do is we, even if, I mean, if a simple molecule, which has, it has got various energy levels. So, moment you confine things. So, for example, in an atom, you confine electron to the nucleus. The, the levels allowed where the electron can be is not continuous in a particular you know, stack of levels, quantized. They have only certain energies. So when you take nitrogen together, they cannot have the individual levels of nitrogen or oxygen. The collective levels will be different from either of these, and they will form a set of bands. These bands, O2 in this, but they do. I mean, that's the way nature is. Uh, uh, we can calculate. So I would like to interrupt here yeah. maybe this discussion can still continue okay, yeah. during the lunch time so may i request now the next speaker professor thank you k.s venkatesh
So I request now Professor uh, K.S. Venkatesh, who is from the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Kanpur. He did his MTech and PhD from IIT Kanpur. His research interests are signal processing, image and video processing, computer vision, and its application in robotics, signal and system theory. He works on miscellaneous theoretical problems. Look at locality invariance theorem, several theory hyperprocessing, and law of non-diminishing symmetry. He has eight patents, more than 130 publications in these area, and he shall be speaking are science and technology inherently unsustainable? So may I request Professor Venkatesh to deliver the talk. Just taking a minute to turn on the light. Just one second. Full screen kar dijiye aap udhar. Yeah. So this talk is going to be very different from uh, the very technical presentations you have had since the morning. And uh, what I wanted to address, this actually is not in a field of research of mine. You're, you're hearing the first non-expert talk since the morning. So, okay, here's, we, since this was about sustainability of science and technology, I realized I have just been thinking about this. I dabble in this kind of stuff. Um, so sustainability itself has many facets to it. One, of course, is I think the most important one is the sustainability of intellectual progress. When we are talking about whether science and technology are sustainable, we need to look a little more closely to see what we are not mixing up with what. So, first of all, there are several things. One is, you know, all this climate change and pollution and whatever, depletion of resources, that's on one side. But more importantly, there are other questions about like, uh, can we keep on inventing, can we keep on understanding, progressing our understanding of nature at the same rate that we have been uh, able to exhibit in the last 100 years or so. You can already see that since 1940 or 1950, considering those 50 years of the 20th century, this is really haven't showed much progress in the last 35 years. When I asked one of my friends this, he said, oh, that was just a one-off. It doesn't happen all the time. That was very, very lucky that we did so many things in such a short time. Okay, the second, and this is very, very important, it's not just enough to be potentially able to make scientific progress. It's equally important that there is political popular support for it. If it doesn't happen, then we will be back to the Middle Ages and Dark Ages or whatever, where only people with a lot of money, landlords, etc., did some experiment in their homes for entertainment. And that's how actually modern science started, but it had to start like that because there was no governmental support, there was no popular support for it. Okay. Just one second. 
so that's very important to recognize the third of course is the quality of life issue you know all about pollution etc which we will come to now what i want to address in these three parts which will actually split up into a few more parts is when when we think as we do today that the most important dimension of human activity is scientific progress it's also probably not very uh, uh not very fashionable to talk about the weaknesses in science and so i thought let me spend a little time telling you about the shortcomings of the scientific method this this set of shortcomings are quite independent of who does the science it could be us it could be martians it could be anybody but the scientific method has some inherent shortcomings and they are the following it certainly no individual pastime as it is practiced today it needs collective action it requires a complete commitment and support from government and the public it practically a way of life as we have been practicing it all these couple of hundred years when practiced with such thorough dedication it becomes an end in itself it has been estimated and there is a very important point that 75% and above of all scientific activity is only for self sustenance and that's what i mean by that is basically this to sustain a nuclear energy program for example it requires you to train a huge number of sophisticated technicians scientists you actually start an industry to build instruments for the nuclear industry then you have technicians you have academic institutions to train the technicians you have to do all this just to get this little final product called nuclear power so behind that little thing behind that little output that you get there's this huge investment in knowledge gathering in manpower in development all this is essential you can't just get the end result without doing all that hard part and that's why i said that a lot of this is self consumption self sustenance now let me go to the next so here what i want to say is some want to point out the difference between engineering and technology on the one side and science on the other side this is also going to impact our questions on sustainability so science, scientists develop conjectures and theories and validate them in carefully controlled closed or so called laboratory conditions careful control is required to limit the number of variables that can affect the result this this is presumably necessary to assert or you know verify the independence or interdependence of various variables so this is the only purified sanitized kind of environment in which basic facts become clear you know if you want to get to explain newton's laws of motion you would be told look it's happening all around you you don't need a lab to understand it but actually you do need a lab to understand it because you have to make those frictionless surfaces you have to use those billiard balls you have to use those inclined planes why do you do all those things just because for us to comprehend what is actually manifest around us it requires that we create situations where things are separated from one another otherwise there are too many factors affecting every phenomenon you see around you and so the pure theories don't come out of it so on the engineering side however the game is very different this is what i'm coming to engineers work in an open environment and not closed environments in general one has to be prepared for all foreseeable variables one just cannot assume that some will not be there the best we can do is to promise a certain high enough probability of successful performance certainty cannot be assured uh it change okay fundamentally it may be said that science plays the role and this is the other relationship between science and engineering one as i said is about science working in a closed environment and engineering working in an open environment the other is that what engineering does is actually take off where science leaves off science tells you what you cannot do what you can do but just telling people what you can do doesn't uh completely uh sorry i messed up this thing 
Just a minute. Yeah. So the laws of science do not limit you to one particular or one unique way of solving a practical problem. It only says you can do a lot of these things and you can choose which way you want to solve this problem, but it has to basically obey these constraints, conservation of energy, whatever, any of those constraints. However, engineering, the task of engineering is to select the most appropriate or the most convenient, the most profitable board nowadays way of solving that problem. And that's where there is a lot of more parameter choosing to be done by engineers because we have to solve God knows all kinds of constraints. See, uh, engineering needs to provide concrete implementations of systems that respect these constraints, of course, but the freedom of uh, to choose from a variety of approaches that lie within the set bounds of the parameters. There may therefore be myriad different ways of solving a problem. We have to select the best one on the basis of a lot of essentially non-scientific considerations, cost, technological maturity, local material availability, environmental impact, expert opinion. All these things will come into finally building something in a certain way or doing something in a certain way. It might be water treatment, it might be power generation, whatever. Okay. Yeah. So, now I come to some of the shortcomings and it is this. The ability of the scientific method to make perfect predictions is limited for several reasons and these are the reasons. The theory or model may actually apply only in a certain parameter range. Though we wouldn't know about it until we observed a serious deviation. We, it's like in old mechanics we had Newton's laws which turned out to be not perfectly accurate the, you know, with the theory of relativity and all that, but everybody was happy with it because we had not conducted those experiments, the kind of experiments, the level of experiments where we would have seen that something was wrong, that things were going off the scale. So we today have a model. We think this is okay, but this is okay only because only as far as you have validated it, you might in a more thorough validation exercise find out that it's actually not good. So this is the point that I wanted to make. So this is one thing until we observe a serious deviation. We may be carrying out mistakenly, carrying on mistakenly believing that it works on a wider parameter range. Simplifying assumptions is the next thing. You see, whenever you propose something, you always have to, whenever you build something, you always have to simplify a lot. If you don't simplify, Things are so complicated, they just cannot be worked out. So we always choose to ignore maybe the effect of air currents when you when you do Galileo's experiment and say that, oh, you know, it's only gravity. Forget about the air affecting it and so on and so forth. So these are the kinds of simplifying assumptions you make. So what happens when you make simplifying assumptions? You are deliberately choosing to be inaccurate. And that, of course, is a careful choice. You normally believe that the inaccuracies are within respectable bounds, but there might be situations where the accuracy goes off. Okay, next, there may be no loopholes in the theory itself that make it useless under certain conditions. You must have heard of the three-body problem in physics where there is a problem in predicting the result of an experiment. The theory itself is perfectly right. But you can never carry out an experiment which exactly does what you are expected to do. There will always be minor perturbations, minor deviations, which will completely change the consequences from what you might predict. So, in short, the theory is all there, but you still can't predict what happens in a particular experiment. And, you know, our real life problems mechanics problems, for example, are not just three body, they're multi body. So you will have so many situations where you may have all the equations right, but still in certain situations, you cannot predict what's going to happen. You just cannot predict what's going to happen. 
disproportionate or non-linear consequences, systems exhibiting chaotic behavior behave drastically different under infinitesimal changes of input. So this is kind of highly unstable systems. You do a little more of something and the result takes, takes off in a completely different direction. These are all limitations in spite of having a theoretical model, having a theory about things. And these are intended to tell you that our inability to foresee all possible scenarios under open operating conditions will come up again for human, you know, in the context of human lack of omniscience. See, we ignore certain variables knowingly. I have mentioned that already in the third bullet, simplifying assumptions. But then that's different from not even expecting certain things to go wrong. If you look at most of these nuclear incidents, incidents meaning unpleasant incidents, then you will see that you ask the people, why did this happen? They will say, we never thought this will happen, but it happened. So exactly, it's like asking somebody, can you think about something that you have never thought of? Or rather, can you think of something that you cannot think of? You can't. You cannot think of something that you can cannot think of. And nobody would have expected there is an earthquake, then a tsunami, then a flooding of the generators, and therefore the, the reactors going out of control. That nobody would have expected. Now we are all wise, but it had to happen once. And in all future projects of science and engineering and technology, this will always be staring at you. You can never be completely confident that you're not going to do something seriously dangerous. It could always happen. Okay, now, so this brings you to the tentative nature of science. This is not to shoot down science, and I will make that clear in my concluding slide. This is to say that what we have is still something which is not as perfect as we think. As I have said here, all these above contributing factors or, uh, you know, should be contributing factors to make mankind more tentative about relationship with science and technology and its reliance on science and technology to deliver heaven on earth. Oh, sorry. Slide change. Yeah. Sorry. Now, unfortunately, most in the scientific community either genuinely don't know or prefer to overlook or understate or blindly um, are simply blind themselves to all these fallibilities, it must be noted that these pitfalls are on account of the knowledge system itself, not the limitations of the practitioner. The knowledge system itself is this. You can be the most, uh, you know, the most effective way of propagating or practicing the knowledge system. These things will still happen. Now, even an omniscient being doing science would face every bit of this. Now we come to something which is... Uh, Oh, time moves, runs faster when you're on the podium. Okay. So there are several limitations. I am not going to even read the whole slides. There are actuatory and sensory limitations. For example, we see only a small band of the electromagnetic spectrum. So a lot of what is here is not even being seen by us. It's just out of our range. So there is the second thing. The second bullet is about limitations of perception and computation. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm making this. Yeah, okay. So, there is this concept of bounded rationality that people in psychology and management talk about. I'll tell you what it is. If you tell something very complicated to someone, they will not try to convince themselves completely that you are right. They will do a rough calculation and say, yeah, I guess you're more or less right. Same way, I mean, this is about simplifying by dropping some variables, you can say. But the fact is, you can, you never, you, your rationality is not infinite. You are not infinitely rational as a species or even as an individual. You do the best you can because you have to take, it's like an answering maybe an examination paper. You do the best you can given that you have to come out with the answer within three hours or whatever. And you say, this is all I do. So this is a limitation of us because we are not, infinitely smart we are not you know we don't have infinite sensory perception sensory capabilities we are not infinitely smart either so this brings us to the third thing uh, which is that very often in many practical situations already being faced today as i have mentioned here a pilot flying a complex machine like an aeroplane you know there are so many things happening in front of him 
that it's very easy to do something wrong. In fact, they do it now and then and we have a crash. Something goes wrong. And just as you're trying to figure things out because you need time to figure out. And you know, they actually have little manuals there. They open it and see, okay, if this thing starts beeping, then I should be trying this first. Can you imagine somebody actually has a time to open a book when the plane is coming down or something? But the system is so complex that you can't carry everything in your head. And that is one of the limitations of the human being. As systems get more and more complicated. Did I change? Yeah. Okay. So the third thing that we have is a lack of reliable memory. This is something I didn't notice recently. Psychological studies have shown that memories in human mind are more like impressions of observations rather than reliable records of facts. Therefore, for example, memories of an event can be manipulated post facto. When one has, what one honestly believes he remembers can actually be a fabrication. Okay. Now, an often overlooked physical limitation of our species is also a limited lifespan. And for me, I, I just thought about it while preparing for this, preparing these slides. You see, we have a lifespan of whatever 80, whatever years, and we are actually very productive and very receptive and capable of learning for maybe 30% of that time. And as science keeps progressing and there is more and more knowledge to be picked up, every child, unfortunately, you can't insert an SD card into his head and say, okay, you start from here. You have to teach them one plus one equals two to every child. You have to do it 1,000 years from now, unless by then they can figure out how to put an SD card in your head. You have to start from the beginning, but you have got a longer way to go because science has gone further. So what do we do? We have a kind of breakup of our education system into some common education where you teach them some three hours and all those things, and then you have specialized education. We end up with a lot of very, I mean, more and more narrow specialists in various areas. And each specialist cannot really communicate with the other very easily. I mean, it's, it's not very easy for someone to explain pharmacology to me. And I guess I, I would take a very long time to understand it. I've tried that with mathematicians. No, no, I, I just don't get it. It takes a long time. It almost becomes each subject practice becomes like a way of life. So as this goes on, as our lifespans more or less remain the same, do you realize that this is going to be a serious impediment to the sustainability of our technical progress? How much more can you keep cramming into somebody's head as it gets more and more? There is this joke about physical review. Physical review is supposed to be the most famous, uh, most respectable journal in physics. They used to apparently have one issue every two months. Then they brought it down to one month. Then I think fortnight or something. Then they started A, B, C, D and all that. And more and more papers were getting published. So this was something that a physics professor told me. So he said, uh, you know, there is this estimation they made that by the year 2100, if you stack all the physical reviews one on top of the other, the height of the stack will rise, increase faster than the speed of light. But the counter to that is, don't worry. It doesn't violate any loss of relativity because it carries no useful information. OK, next. So there are also collective human limitations which are even more serious. Functioning as a group instead of as individuals, we have very inefficient methods of communicating knowledge to each other. We have to talk, we have to write, we have to show figures. These things will always limit the way we work as a group. If you are one person who knows everything, you are far more powerful, far more capable of applying your knowledge than we can ever be as a group of separate, disconnected specialists. And that's the point I wanted to make. Another problem, large populations have never solved the problem of reconciling individual priorities with collective good. So. We have no collective identity. As the saying goes, we are individually helpless and collectively irresponsible. Now, it's again all about human beings and it's about how this is going to affect or challenge the sustainability of human progress. Because 
on the science and technology isn't going to make us behave better we are going to behave the same way as i have said here we seem to be you know war seems to be the popular final way to settle many questions our inability to avoid or minimize aggression and to simply compromise and get along has not improved one bit since the dark ages it's not likely to change in future we will remain a squabbling species gain is the decider there is no a priority a prior commitment to non aggression the argument means uh, meant to apply to relationships between nations finally this uh, economic convulsion uh, you know compulsions and the finite universe there's also the question of distribution of whatever goods oh sorry yeah i miss it every alternate slide okay so what we are saying is whatever goods we do have whatever benefits of science technology etc are distributed very unevenly within the population and that gives rise to a lot of social tension now within self governed communities there is no sense of equity political ideologies have tried to distribute wealth and social good you know and uh, you know you know okay the winning ideology is the rule of the currently powerful and one that defines success by the amount of growth so as long as you believe that growth is the measure of success and growth since it's measured in percentages will always be exponential growth so you are trying to do uh, endless growth in a finite universe that's just not going to happen but more importantly there is also the problem of growth depending upon consumerism and things like that these will force you i mean this will help you to grow faster and at the cost of a lot of expensive depletion of resources and things like that so a lot of quality of life sustain you know sustainability issues come because of depletion of resources and a lot of the depletion is occurring because of excessive unnecessary consumption rather than you know just population rise or something like that the economic system is responsible for that finally now we have never solved the problem okay we have no collective identity okay this slide got missed so finally who will get hit first quite apart from the collective pressures yeah when water becomes scarce different sections of society are affected very differently in the ongoing heat wave the middle class and above will only grumble about their higher electricity bills the underprivileged will suffer much more second oh oi ah yeah it came okay okay so you see this is a problem so because of this structural flaw resource non sustainable non sustainability will hit us neither equally nor simultaneously no sudden water outage in the bathroom tomorrow morning for us it will come as a calibrated progression of deprivation from the bottom up this of course is already happening look at our villages look at our slums they don't have what we have and it doesn't matter to us you know we hold this nice symposia here and have lunch after that and all that but the point is the crunch is already there it's been happening for a while and thus non sustainable sustainability takes on a more subtle softer form that makes the situation more serious the privileged will take longer to feel the pinch and will continue to make irresponsible choices fine finally this for me is a very very important last but one slide one is now witness to some very alarming regressive tendencies in the general population in the social debate of how bad modern science is the public bases its criticism of the scientific enterprise on all the wrong reasons we seem to be heading back towards the dark ages with post truth and revisionism granted that allopathic medicine is fraught with side effects over exploitation of resources has caused pollution and nuclear weapons threaten our civilization all these are the things that people throw at you and you say you know science is bad for human beings or science is bad for us but the success or failure of modern science and our preference or non preference for it needs to be decided after comparison with the alternatives that we have what are the alternatives we have i am not saying that we don't need to change ourselves but it is no point you know the alternative certainly cannot be to relapse into non rigorous systems of knowledge 
That I think is something we have to agree. This is one clear step forward we have taken into a blind belief in the omniscience of our ancients that they possessed the solution for all our current problems and they were wise and we people are stupid. You know, this kind of regressive thinking I think is very, very worrisome. And it's happening all around us. There was, you know, on YouTube you can see one Indian Science Congress um, talk, which I think many of you would have seen, where you, know, you can't imagine the kind of things people said. Very worrying. For example, it has been argued that technology in the hands of the privileged has been used as a force multiplier to exacerbate social inequity. But the counter to it is that human knowledge is now also much better disseminated and this helps the underprivileged to also fight back and aspire for greater things. Finally, okay. So, what did I say? I spoke about epistemic and procedural fallibilities irrespective of the agent. Second, agent fallibilities at the individual level irrespective of the method. Sensory limitations, whatever, whatever, memory. Collective fallibilities as a group. Economic system, the compulsions of the economic system we have adopted, that is probably the only thing we might be able to change sometime if there is a revolution or something. Political backwardness, we are unable to rec reconcile collective good with individual priorities. The impact of inequity on sustainability, how it gives you a progression in deprivation rather than hits everybody equally. And finally, U-turns and intellectual decline. The withdrawal of popular support. If a large number of people, maybe in our country, decide that, you know, science is all evil anyway. We knew all this and better than this 2,000 years ago. Then we have had it. This will be the last Insa Symposium. Okay? Maybe they will call it the same thing. I don't know. But so this is essentially the thoughts that I put down for my presentation. Now I'm done and questions from anybody if there are anything. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Is there any comment or uh, question to him? A brief question. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but at least there are several other incidents where it's, it's just the lack of foresight that leads to things that happen. And as we say, you know, you cannot think of what you cannot think of. If that makes sense. Yeah. So this leads us to this ever, you know, the tentative nature of everything we do. You do something and you can only say, this looks okay, but I hope I have not missed something. It's always possible to miss something. Sorry, I have taken a... Sabisachi Sanyal from uh, CDRI Lucknow, and he has been a very prolific scientist. He has been working on metabolic diseases, including type 2 diabetes, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, and skeletal muscle atrophy. He has two pet patents so far and has published more than 75 papers with a very high citation scores. And Dr. Sanyal is also the fellow of Nasi Allahabad. Uh, he shall be speaking on the female hormone estradiol overcomes the adiponectin resistance in diabetic mice, a study deciphering the higher metabolic fitness in females. So may I request Dr. Sanyal to... Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's really nice meeting you after a long time. And uh, thank Same you here. all. <laughs> thank you all. And I particularly thank uh, someone for this wonderful opportunity. And thanks to Insa as well. So uh, 
I'll straight away start the talk because we are all hungry right now. And at a like meta metabolically very critical point. <clears throat> so it's not a great time to talk about metabolism, but hope you can understand what I'm saying. So we know all about diabetes. I mean, everyone is aware. Almost one uh, in three is at a risk of this particular disorder. And uh, we all know about insulin and insulin resistance. This is pretty common. So I'm not going to talk much about it here. But uh, what are the causes of diabetes? If we look at it deeply, so since from like human samples, we cannot take much. We take blood and do the analysis. And also like uh, when you consider the clinical data, it is very important to get the clinical data, but the problem arises is once a person is diagnosed with diabetes, obviously that person is going to get treated. So the data points from when the uh, treatment starts, how much improvement has actually taken place, no idea is there. So the thing is that we have to do some animal studies to actually get the clear picture. And like, it is not ethically really great to torture the animals, but we can still, uh, within ethical boundaries, we can keep them untreated and observe what are the things happening. So if you look at diabetes, it's mostly because of energy imbalance uh, that is occurring there. Diabetes or any other metabolic syndrome that includes these, these uh, phenotypes. So when the caloric intake is high and the expenditure is low, so what do you mean by expenditure? One is obviously your physical activity, so how much you are burning that calorie. Second is, with age, our metabolism slows down. So the resting metabolic rate, that if that slows down, then again there is a caloric imbalance. So what happens to the excess calorie? That is deposited in specialized organs for energy storage. Those are mainly fats. So Fats are pretty good organs. They are not, there's nothing bad about them. But once they cross a certain threshold level in the body percentage, some of the fats, they start behaving in a very disturbing manner. They become inflammatory. So there is another point to it that inflammation itself can cause fat accumulation and fat itself, again, contributes to inflammation. So it's a vicious cycle, basically, that happens when this kind of disorders take place. So what we have is chronic low-grade inflammation, and there is clinical data is clear about it. From the preclinical data, we find, because we cannot take muscle biopsies or other uh, things very readily, so we have to uh, depend on the preclinical data, and we find that mitochondrial dysfunction, chronic oxidative stress, they contribute to this whole scenario, this whole vicious cycle. Now, about diabetes, you know about basic things about insulin, glucose, and all other things, but there's some unknown facets, or rather lesser known facets, that are equally important, I'm going to talk about them. So, now the question is, so these things are happening. Now, is there a candidate biomolecule that is inside us, that is endogenously expressed, and preferably non-steroidal, that can address all these concerns? And it's not progressing, the slide. So do I have to point somewhere? Yeah. So the molecule is called adiponectin. So it's not very famous uh, in the general public, but if you look at uh, scientific uh, domain, it is pretty famous. So this was discovered in 95, and there are 23,000 PubMed entries. What is most important thing about this particular protein is that uh, this is available in the serum in the microgram level which is pretty, pretty high when you compare it with something else like estradiol or progesterone, they are available at picograms level. So picogram, nanogram, and we have something here that is available at a very, very high amount. That essentially means it's probably very, very safe for the body. And now when the depletion of this particular factor occurs in the blood, that has been associated with multiple lifestyle disorders they include obesity, insulin resistance, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, various cancers, fatty liver disease, kidney fibrosis, etc. So paradoxically, in some cases, you see this adiponectin level is actually elevated. 
Now, from human data, we couldn't get that, but from preclinical data in mouse and other animal models, we know that that is not harmful, actually. What is happening is adiponectin resistance is happening. So like in insulin resistance, the insulin receptors, they kind of become uh, less active or the pathway is actually uh, uh, compromised. In here as well, the adiponectin receptors, they become less effective. Uh, less effective. Now, there are two primary receptors. There are more, actually, but I'm going to talk about them. So they are highly expressed in either skeletal muscle or liver and are involved in all these pathways that include glucose lipid metabolism, inflammation, mitochondrial biogenesis or function, and chronic oxidative stress. So it has huge therapeutic potential. But the problem is, even if it has a huge therapeutic potential, it cannot be translated. So that means, I mean, you have systemic depletion. So what do you do? You, you naturally give more adiponectin and hope for the best. But we cannot do that because it's a complex protein. So to put it uh, into perspective, human insulin, which is given, this, this is five times the size of human insulin. And moreover, it has like complex multimerization pro properties. So larger scale production is not possible. So we use this form, globular adiponectin, in the latest studies. I will show you uh, the slides. And the amount we use is roughly a few grams. And if we had to purchase that from market, those few grams, it would have costed us 600 crores of Indian rupees. So 10 kilos of globular adiponectin at your hand is probably equivalent to Reliance's net worth. So now these are the receptors. You can hear me, right? Yeah. So these are the receptors, uh, adipo R1 or 2, and they participate in all these pathways, like decreased gluconeogenesis, decreased lipid synthesis, fatty acid oxidation, improved insulin sensitivity, and all these things. So how they achieve it? Through regulating all these pathways, and the hallmarks of adiponectin signaling uh, will come to this. These are important. Please remember these factors. AMP kinase activation, P38 activation, and AKD activation. These are all kinases involved in energy metabolism. And there is a super factor called PGC1-alpha. This is an inducible protein. Actually, you say like after exercise, you need a cold bath or cold shower that will actually improve your uh, endurance and other capabilities. That is probably because of this factor. So this factor is, uh, goes up under cold shock and is pretty transient in nature and does a lot of important functions. There are other factors like PPR alpha, CD36. These are involved in fatty acid metabolism and you have uncoupling proteins. These are equally important in terms that you can see like there are some lean people who have very high body temperature. That means they're dissipating heat and that is probably occurring due to UCP. So what happens there is that your ATP production, if it is too much, so it needs to be dissipated. So the uncoupling of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport chain happens, and due to uncoupling proteins, and the energy is dissipated as heat, which is, again, a protective mechanism for cold adaptation. And then you have glucose transporters as well. So now adiponectin resistance, if it happens due to uh, lowering down of the adiponectin receptor expressions, it goes hands in hand, hand in hand with insulin resistance. And the situation that is created is ultimately a vicious cycle that causes progressive degeneration of the diabetic condition. If left untreated, it will ultimately lead to severe metabolic abnormalities across various organs and is life-threatening. So I said earlier that producing adiponectin as a therapeutic option was the non-existence. So the only probable uh, way to address this would, would probably be small molecules. Now, I didn't have any idea of this receptor or its activities, but we were looking at the mechanism of action of a compound isolated from this plant. And this was identified as an osteoanabolic agent, that is bone anabolic agent. So when we tried to understand the mechanism of action this, of this compound, after intense exploration of more than four years, we found that this molecule is actually heating adipo R1 and R2. So the binding studies are here. And if we overexpress adipo R1, then this intensity of the effect went up. If we knocked them down or depleted the receptor expression, then the intensity went down. And we thought lottery luck gain. So, what we need to do now is uh, do it in vivo. So naturally, 
anabolic, it's all fine. But adiponectin function is mostly like you, you can see in diabetes and other metabolic diseases. So we wanted to check the in vivo efficacy in diabetic mice. Now, these are genetically uh, diabetic mice. So leptin receptor gene is mutated. So if you look at the diabetic mice, they are called DBDB mice. So there are two strains available. One is B6-DBDB and one, this strain accidentally was mated with some other strain of mice and that created a BKS-DBDB model. Now what happens in B both of them, they are diabetic, obese, everything is there. But this strain is very resilient to diabetes. So after a certain age, their glycemic status almost remains the same. Insulin goes up, and the insulin, which if it goes up in normal cases, would cause a lot of devastation in the body. It doesn't do anything here. So this mouse survived the normal lifespan of 18 to 20 months. But these mice, there is a progressive degeneration effect, and they die within 10 months of age. Now, we didn't have... Uh, diabetic mice we had here, but the colony was not enough. We had the case we did with the other one, the one with like progressive degeneration. But uh, those mice were that time not available with us. So con uh, contacted our uh, collaborators at Zydus Research Center and did this uh, analysis. So after like four weeks of treatment, there was remarkable improvement in a lot of factors that include blood glucose the gluconeogenesis, you can see the pancreatic beta cell health was much uh, elevated. And if you see the NFLD was gone, a lot of these factors that include inflammatory cytokines, they all went down. So it was a brilliant effect that we saw. But now we wanted to, we, want, we became greedy, we wanted to file a patent. So for filing a patent, what you need is some kind of comparison with uh, standard of care drug. So what we did, is uh, we didn't still have the animals at our disposal. We had some female animals, and normally people don't work, want to work with females when it comes to diabetes. The reason is that they have their stress cycle, so there are a lot of hormonal changes, and there can be a lot of deviation in things. So they prefer male to be the safe ones. But we didn't have male animals. We tried it in female animals, and they worked wonderfully. So after 15 days, we saw glucose lowering effect. So we thought we didn't have the uh, animals, so let's outsource it. So we outsource it to a company, and there they use the same strain, they use male mice. And we were shocked to see that there was no effect at all. So now, basically, this is devastating. So what happens is there, when we devise hypothesis, and that has some connection with ego, so if it fails, we get devastated, we, or we try to bend the results to fit our hypothesis. But let me tell you, to the students particularly, is that if something does not match your hypothesis, that means a far more interesting thing is happening. So you search for it. So we started searching. Now, obviously, I told you earlier that if insulin resistance happens, insulin level goes up, adiponectin receptor level, actually starts coming down at the mRNA level. We found that, well, it was coming down in both both the DBDB mice here. So there was no problem. Uh, this was coming down. Uh, this is healthy mice, and these were coming down. But there was no difference between these two diabetic animal groups. But when we looked at the protein level, there was a huge difference. So these DBDB, the good DBDB, they didn't have much problem in the skeletal muscle or in the liver. The Adipo R1 and R2 levels went down, and it was like even more manifested in the membrane fractions. So we took muscle cells from these mice, and we gave them globular adiponectin or our compound GTDF, and we saw whether they're responding. And as you can see, in back 6 mice, that's the normal mouse, it's working. In DBDB, that is the good DBDB, it's still working, but in this case, you can see absolutely no difference. So we were looking for what are the factors that are actually causing this post-transcriptional. So RNA is transcriptional, and RNA to protein is translational event. So what is causing this post-transcriptional differences? So there were some papers about some of the factors which are regulating adiponectin receptors in cancers. We actually checked them, and we found these two factors called PTB, this is the RNA binding protein, and a microRNA, MIT-221. They, in black 6 DVDB mice, the healthy one, you can see there was very little increase with the age. But if you look at BKS-DBDB, PTB went really high, 
and here mid 221 that one also really high so now there is a connection between estrogen and mid 221 uh, and that connection has been established in breast cancer so the question was the observations were these so the question were is there a sexually dimorphic adiponectin sensitivity in bks dvdv mice is the mechanism similar to what we observed in B6 versus BKS DVDB? So we are talking about female mice because of this, the, this slide. So in female, we saw the effect. In the males, we didn't see the effect. That's why we asked those questions. Now, if you look at male versus female, what is the most obvious difference other than the phenotype? That is, presence of this hormone is CYP19A1. It's also present in male, but if you see female, it's present at a much higher level. So both male and female, they produce testosterone, and this is modified. This this modifies testosterone to estradiol. So if you look at this CYP19 expression, so in the ovary or uh, female reproductive area, it is pretty highly expressed. It is also expressed in some fat cells that include mammary fat pads and this uh, fat pads in the thigh. That's the femoral fat pad. In male, it is expressed mainly in the abdomen, very little amount, and in some some amount in the uh, gonadal region as well. So if you consider metabolic uh, actions of estradiol, it's anti-inflammatory and anti and immunomodulatory. And postmenopausal women, they typically have higher risk of metabolic disease. So in postmenopausal women, obviously the estrogen goes down. Oophorectomy, that is removal of ovary in certain medical conditions, they can cause uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. And CYP191 mutation in males, so it is equally important in males. Even in males, this is mutated. That causes metabolic disorders. And if you look at fat deposition and macrophage infiltration, that means the type of fat, whether it's a uh, kind of like, you know, neutral type of fat or inflammatory fat, that is also determined by estradiol. So there are, you can see a lot of uh, colleagues of us even, oh, sorry, it's, <laughs> so why some obese people have normal lipid profile and are disease free? It's probably because of this. The fat deposition in males are mostly abdominal and in females, they are peripheral. So what happens is that, so we took global diaponectin and treated them to male versus female mice to see this. And if we find, so body weight, uh, feed intake went down, body weight went down and lean mass, they were increased in female mice and fat mass was decreased, but nothing happened to the male mice. So we looked at glucose, and the same thing happened. In male mice, there were no change, and the female mice, there were a lot of improvement. So we looked at the adiponectin sensitivity uh, indicators that the, the pathways that are regulated by adiponectin. So if you look at this, all these factors were up upon globular adiponectin treatment in female mice, but nothing happened in the male mice. So now we looked at those factors, the PTB and me 221 expression, as well as adiponectin receptor expression across different age groups in female mice, because, you know, this is a progression, uh, progressive disease. So in female, it was always high. In male, it went down. So if you see here, the graphs, it goes down. And uh, if you look at uh, PTB and me 21 they were correlated with this. So... Now the question was, okay, male mice have this problem, female don't have the problem. So if we inject male mice with estradiol, can it reverse the condition? So it did happen. So we did a pilot experiment. So we treated this male mice with estradiol for 14 days. And after that, we gave a dose of globular adiponectin for only 30 minutes to see the signaling. So if you see here, estradiol itself increased the adipo R1 expression and globular adiponectin increase the sensitivity. So we did a more detailed analysis, and we found that after giving like estradiol for like about 23 days continuously, and after this period, we were giving like globular adiponectin, and all these improvements were occurring in male mice. So, and uh, that was associated with higher uh, expression and lower PTB and B221 expression. So these observations were made. So the question now was, can the reverse be true? So if you remove this uh, estradiol from female mice, will they succumb to uh, metabolic disorders? So we did ovarectomy. We removed the ovaries for like, uh, after removing ovaries, we waited for six weeks and then treated the, them with estradiol for seven days and did sacrifice. And 
if you see here, adiponectin receptor level went down, PPR levels went down, all these factors which are receptive to adiponectin receptor signaling, they went down. So adipo hormone RNA as well uh, went down to some extent, and these, uh, these factors also went down. So also there were improvement, uh, improvement in glucose tolerance in these mice. And that was uh, that was uh, that could be correlated with adiporectin receptor expression. So the question now was whether estradiol and E are directly influenced. So whether this is happening because of some indirect effect or some direct effect. So for that, we needed experiments in a secluded environment, and that is in cell lines. So this cell line, MDMB231, it doesn't naturally express adiponectin receptors. Uh, sorry estrogen receptors and has a low level of adiponectin receptors. So when we introduce estrogen receptors in there, here and here you can see <coughs> adiporectin receptor level went up and these two factors, they went down. So the thing is that this was happening there. So we wanted to check whether PTB and me 2 both are directly regulated by estradiol. Since we're addressing skeletal muscle, we wanted to check whether these are happening in the skeletal muscle itself. So I'll not come to this. So we, we created a situation of hyperinsulinemia. If you look here, <coughs> in hyperinsulinemic condition, naturally adiponectin mRNA goes down, that is known. So the protein also went down. Now, PTB is one factor when differentiation in uh, C2C12 myotubes, uh, myoblasts take place, PTB goes down, but it never came back uh, when we treated them with estradiol. But MI-221 uh, level were rescued. So the thing is that what we ultimately found is that in male mice, estrogen level is pretty low. So that causes uh, uh, downregulation of adiponectin mRNA as well as uh, upregulation of these factors. And they total uh, come together to cause a downregulation of the adiponectin receptor protein. And in female mice, they are still up because uh, E2 will actually inhibit these factors and ultimately will rescue the phenotype to a certain extent. So females are actually much more protected when it comes to this. So the icing on the cake is that when we check B6 and B, uh, BKS DVDB animals, we found that if you look age-wise, B6 DVDB male mites has huge estrogen level. So that actually protected them from all the uh, uh, side effects of hyperinsulinemia. And in BKS DVDB female, the bad uh, DVD mice in which males are really, really sick, the, uh, they also had pretty high level of uh, estradiol. So that's what, in our cases, showed that the they, these mice, how they become uh, adiponectin sensitive. So the inferences are female at, uh, females at reproductive age are metabolically fitter compared to uh, postmenopausal women and age matched female. And this metabolic fitness is due to the female hormone estradiol. E2 reverses hyperinsulinemia driven suppression of adipo R1 expression by countering insulin's effect at both transcriptional and post transcriptional level. E2 ameliorates both insulin and adiponectin resistance. So these are the observations that we gain. And uh, what we can suggest from this study is that. Well, a lot of people, they have like progressive diabetes and they're rather treatment refractory. So what we can do after a uh, proper clinical trial is give them dietary in intervention that contains phytoestrogens or actually increase estradiol levels in the body for a certain short period of time that can range from like a week to uh, a month. And then probably the diabetic medic uh, medicines would work better in them. So that's the kind of message and advice to all males here, get in touch with your feminine self, get some estrogen up uh, and that will help you. So thank you. Thank you, Sanyal, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm sorry I had to interrupt you in between because no the time was less. So uh, I think, uh, is there any question to Dr. Sanya? So I have a question, uh, if I may ask. <laughs> Actually, you have generated different phenotypes, which are 
depicting or which have insulin resistance. Yes. So all these, like where you are giving estradiol or you are also uh, having uh, this uh, overectomized ovaric animals. Have you checked the adiponectin levels? Yes, ma'am. In overectomized they... animal, uh, if you go to this slide, I, I didn't have time to explain this, yeah, yeah. but if you go to the, uh, where is the overectomized animal, uh, this is the over... Yeah, actually... Oh, yeah, here. If you see adiponectin levels in the overectomized animal, they were much higher. So that's why without even adding globular adiponectin, things were happening. Yes. So they were getting globular uh, sensitive. So thank you so much. And uh, the second se session comes to yes. an end. Or oh, is there any? Okay. Yes. And again, I'm saying is that here, condition, it's always a more controlled environment. You know what to expect and from where you can, like the outcomes. So that is, that is why I put them those slides. have also discussed very interesting way of like how they look at in their labs in the different aspects of science. Uh, with this, I also want to thank Saman for giving me an opportunity to be here. And uh, I request now to. Um, uh, so and we, we were hoping to get back at 2.20, but I think that's not going to be possible. So let's keep it 2.30, but 2.30 sharp. Okay, so guys, please come back here at 2.30. And uh, for the students who are to speak now after, in the afternoon session, please load your presentations here in the site. Please come out now and load them and then join us for lunch in the canteen. Right. So uh, thank you. We'll just uh, break for lunch now.
Hello, 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 ho kya? Ho kya la raha sala? Ho, hello, ho, hello.
lined up. Uh, so we have Dr. Nautyal and then Kanika and then the research scholars uh, discussion and interaction. So to set the stage, I would <clears throat> uh, proceed for the session three and uh, this in this session, Dr. Nautyal would be presenting and giving a theme overview. Uh, just a brief introduction about Dr. Nautyal. He studied physics from IIT Roorkee and then obtained his PhD from PRL Ahmedabad. And uh, his research interest revolves around Earth, planetary science, paleo, uh, paleo uh, climatology, archaeology. And he superannuated as scientist in charge um, in the radiocarbon lab at BSIP. He's recipient of many recognitions like INSA Metal for Young Scientists. His work has been recognized by a paleo, uh, paleo Botanical Society Lucknow. He has uh, he has been a member of National Committee for Archaeological Sciences, and he has also been a very uh, prolific uh, science communicator and science educator. He also works with DSTs and uh, CSIR uh, Science Communication Wing. He is now program consultant for science communication to INSA and he serves as secretary for UP Academy of Sciences. So I would now like to request Dr. Nautyal to present the theme. Thank you, Dr. Mithi, for the kind introduction. Uh, the chairman, Professor Shaha, Dr. Saman, uh, Dr. Madhu Dekshit, other distinguished speakers, uh, I think they outnumber the audience and uh, the distinguished audience. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, uh, so it's really, uh, I think until they switch it on, my time will not start, okay? <laughs> so uh, I have 10 minutes to talk to you and it's really a challenge. It's, uh, uh, sorry for intruding on your uh, siesta time. Uh, it's a big challenge to keep the audience awake after the in the lecture, which is immediately after lunch during the summer season. So we'll be uh, talking to you, uh, we all will be talking about the scientific temple and this uh, international year for basic sciences for the sustainable development goals. Uh, Professor D.S. Kothari, the former president of Indian National Science Academy once wrote, the power of science to transform society is immense perhaps more than any other activity, and science will suffer grievously and in the end reduced to mockery if all its power is not yoked to alleviate human suffering. I think this is something which uh, International Year uh, for Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development also aims at. There is another interesting quote from Isaac Asimov who said, a public that doesn't understand how science works can too easily fall prey to those ignoramuses who make fun of what they don't understand, or to the sloganeers who proclaim scientists to be the mercenaries, mercenary warriors of today and the tools of the military. The difference between understanding and not understanding is also the difference between respect and admiration on one side and hate and fear on the other. So science has to work for the society, uh, even though that cannot be the only aim of the, uh, doing science, and we have to reach the ultimate person, the most, uh, the poorest person in the society. And if we can reach that person and the benefits can accrue to him or her, I think that the science has succeeded. But then why should public know about science and technology? Several reasons can be given. It may influence their life. It's important for society's health because it's not just the physical health which is important, it's also the mental health uh, of the society, which is very important, and we want the attitude of the people to be scientific. Scientists deserve recognition. They should also serve as role models, apart from cricketers and film stars and dancers. We should also distinguish science from technology. And we want today to emphasize the point that basic sciences are very important. And as uh, most of the speakers said since this morning, that basic science is really important and technology or applied science cannot uh, progress without the basic science. Scientific attitude is one thing. Uh, 
uh, we have seen in the media many issues which have been discussed during the past 30 years or so, and they have been about, <coughs> about plague, about the total solar eclipses, alignment of flares, Mohonochua Meris, the face scratcher, earthquake, landslide, tsunami, hurricane, the Gyan rail, several years, and also that the statues drinking milk and the plague, the total solar eclipses, alignment of planets and all. What is the computer capture? Okay. And there are many such topics which the media has been discussing during the last 30 years. So there have been occasions when media has been talking about science. There have been occasions when media has been talking about applications, applications of science uh, for the betterment of people. But still, I don't think that is enough. And I feel that the scientists should take up this responsibility of communicating science to the people. Until that happens, we will have to leave it to the people who don't understand and appreciate science. I'm not saying that every science communicator has to be a scientist, but more and more scientists should come forward and talk science to people because they are the one who understand it completely. It's very difficult for somebody with a degree in history or Hindi literature to understand science and communicate to people. We see in newspapers uh, every year, and it has, I have been seeing for the, uh, since uh, 2005, every year around the month of August, you see that the Mars is coming close to the Earth, and tonight it will appear bigger than Moon. And this has been appearing and reappearing. And uh, there is no effort made by people seriously to, uh, to explain to people that this cannot happen because of the relative sizes of the two, um, uh, Moon and Mars. Mars is bigger, true, but the distance is so much larger that the apparent size of Mars can never be close to Moon. But this keeps happening. But then we don't present science to the people in uh, an in interesting manner. We don't make it so interesting and the result is that people don't uh, get attracted to that. But this is one example, uh, almost fifth, more than 15 years ago, there was a science train which was moving all across the country. And you see the response of the people. This is the crowd gathered there to go and watch the exhibits in the train. It was a moving train, therefore it was a moving exhibition. Same thing can be done with boats, with ships, with abandoned aeroplanes and so on. So what is uh, the responsibility of the scientific community is to make sure that science is presented and presented in an interesting way. But then we also get an impression that when we talk of science, we will be hurting the sentiments of the people because many people think that science is against our ancient values. I don't think that is true. Many of the faiths, many of the practices in our religion or in our society are actually very environment friendly. When people used to say that pehle, uh, they did not mean really in the religious sense, but we know that plantation of trees is very important for saving this earth. And as an aside, I may tell you that this talk of saving the earth is not really a very wise thing, as Paul Colo has said. He said, you're stupid, you are talking about saving the earth. You worry about yourself. Earth has been there for four and a half billion years. It will continue to be there for another billions of years. It's we who have to worry about uh, ourselves. Now, scientific thinking or temper implies going by evidence. And this is what every scientist stands by. But then at the same time, every experiment has not been done. Every idea present in the books has not been tested. So we don't discard everything which has not been discarded, uh, which has not been established or proved by science. We keep them in a section which is neither proved nor disproved. So I think we should take this scientific approach. Uh, otherwise, uh, not believing something without disproving it is also wrong. And it's as much wrong as believing something which has not been established. So we also go by the accumulated wisdom and others experience like potassium cyanide. I have never tested it, but I will never, I know. Logic and sentiments, both are very important when we come to the communicating to people. Uh, the Zahra and I had published an article. So many traditions are scientific, just that we don't understand the science behind them. And during this period of Corona or COVID-19, we have understood the meaning of quarantine. And this was a practice uh, which was rampant in the society. And anybody, if anybody died, and most of the time it used to be because of infectious diseases. 
So people used to be kept in quarantine for 13 days or so. And this is what science also today advises. So we don't have to discard everything which is old. And now the problem comes is when in between people started putting too much emphasis on the applied science or so-called applied science. But what is applied science without the basic sciences? I am not saying that every time technology emanates out of science, it does not happen. We started using fire before we knew about plasma physics. We started using wheel before we knew the relationship between circumference of a circle and radius of the circle. So many, very often technology came before science, but when it comes to the application of the technology, it's a basic science, which is uh, something which must be understood before that. Another uh, problem was, underlying philosophy was that when people started talking about sustainable development, people said that we are blind after technology, we are blindly going after it, and we are ignoring the basic science, and too much technology has meant too much of wastage, which is harmful to this mother earth. Now, underlying philosophy was that industries will survive only if the natural resources are available, and similarly for the agriculture. But should this be the only reason why we should care about nature? Why we should care about sustainability? In the year 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development published its report by the name Our Common Future. By the time Rio de Janeiro meet happened in 92, the term sustainability and sustainable development were quite popular. They were quite well known to the people. Agenda 2030 in the year 2015, which was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly, it was an integrated vision for the sustainable development of all the world's population. But then some people had a very serious problem. They said that anthropocentric view, that means keeping humankind in the center before thinking anything about this globe or is this nature or for the animals or for the birds or the plants, is it really necessary? We always think in terms of a world which is centered around the human being. This is not a very good approach. So people have started now talking about this international year uh, for basic sciences, uh, for sustainable development goals or for sustainable development. And the themes, as uh, uh, Professor Shaha mentioned in the morning, was strengthening the presence and the visibility of women. Well, we see it. Professor Shaha is a lady, and Dr. Saman, the convener of the <laughs> symposium, is a uh, lady too. Basic sciences and resources of international dialogue and peace. We will hear a lecture about it uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Gupta next lecture. Science as a global public good, innovation and economic development, education and human development, and meeting global challenges. And this, the whole humanity has to do together. These are the 17 sustainable development goals, which were also mentioned by Professor Shaha in the morning. Now, these 17 goals are fine. Using technology is fine. Applying science uh, for the development of technology is also fine. But when they go to a large scale, if we don't understand the basic science, we will not be successful. We have known it during the past two years. If we did not understand the basic science behind the virus, behind the disease caused by virus, uh, the immunity mechanism of the body, we won't have been successful in devising the vaccines or think or even think of medicines uh, for the viral diseases. So basic sciences are important because they are the essential tools to ensure uh, dialogues across cultures, also for political stability and peace, and they are essential to the implementation of these uh, sustainable development goals, and they are also provided by basic sciences. The training skill and know-how necessary for adopting to the technology, using them most effectively, also needs basic science. The operational models and practical ways of networking developed by the basic science community will contribute to ensuring the effective implementation of the uh, sustainable development goals. Now, where do communicators come in the picture? Communicators come in the picture because they can change the thinking of the society. This is my experience from 2007 when there was a scare because of the so-called three scratcher or Mohunochua. In places like Sitapur, Baramanki, Banaras, there was total chaos. Law and order system was totally disrupted because people not coming out of their houses after six in the evening because they thought there is a face scratcher which would damage them. We went there and within a few hours time, we could convince people as communicators by sheer logic that this is an impossibility what they're talking about 
And from the next day, I learned from the SDM and later from the SP and the commissioner that problem in Sitapur was completely solved. So this is where we talk with them just about the basic science. There's so much energy cannot be available with something like a munochwa, which is not a material body. It cannot contain so much energy to give a very high shock uh, to human beings. There was a uh, news in a national newspaper that dolphins are going blind. And the reason cited was that effluents from the Narora nuclear power reactor. They said the dolphins are going blind. As you know, that there are hardly 1,200 dolphins left in the world. So as far as environmentalists were concerned, this was a very serious issue. But then do you know what I found? I looked around in the literature, talked to the people, and I found out that dolphins were blind indeed, but they were not going blind because they were born blind. Dolphins are born blind, and it had nothing to do with the nuclear power reactor in the, in the Narora. So this kind of things can only be tackled with some very, very basic science. You remember in 1995, this was the first time total, uh, total solar eclipse, which was uh, broadcasted or uh, telecast by our uh, Doodarshan. At that time, there used to be only one channel. I had an opportunity to give live commentary on that. And this gentleman you see in the center, can you recognize him? Professor J.V. Nallikar, Padma Bhushan Professor J.V. Nallikar, one of the most famous Indian astrophysicists. He was a gold medalist from Cambridge. He was also there, Professor Rashpal was in Delhi. And why I'm mentioning this thing is because we are talking about the basic sciences and sustainable goals. If we convince people why we have to achieve sustainable goals, they will follow the doctrine given by us, otherwise they will not. You have to convince them. Just on the previous night, we had 600 children coming from the nearby villages of Ghurpur and Iradat Ganj, who listened to our lectures, interacted with us, saw our slideshow, and they were convinced that there is no harm in watching the total solar eclipse. This was for the first time in the history of India, perhaps in the last centuries, where people were not afraid of looking at the total solar eclipse. And after that, there have been many such occasions. I myself gave a live commentary on several of them. Total lunar eclipse, lunar eclipse, total solar eclipse, partial solar eclipse, the Venus transit, all these I have commented upon. And people were there by, in hopes, in huge number, to watch it without any fear. Another example, we were successful in convincing people about the power of wearing masks the power of washing hands with soap solution, because those people who understood a little bit of science, we could tell them that if this is a soap solution, this will be uh, joining the, uh, the membrane, which is the lipid, um, lipid membrane over the protein shell of the virus. It will be joining water to that. The soap uh, molecule will do that. And therefore, when you wash your hands in running water, this will be washed off and you will get rid of the virus. We could show them uh, the results of the experiments that if you are wearing mask, the reach of the virus becomes very short. The air or the wind which comes out of the mouth would go otherwise to four meters, but when you are wearing a mask, this reduces to two feet or three, and therefore the person who is at a distance of four feet is safe. If you convince people with the power of logic, but then let us not overestimate the power of logic. We all know, we never say I love you with this sign of the real diagram of heart. We always send a heart like that. So whenever we communicate to people, whenever we send any message, it has to target the mind and the heart both. And I think this is where the success of a good communicator will lie. Uh, so I think I, 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 I can just end with this one remark that uh, India is a very unique country. We have people, people here of different temperaments, different cultural practices, different religions, different languages. We are a place where you take a satellite on a bullock cart. We have sometimes right in the middle of the train track, we have, so we are a very uh, different kind of people. So we have to have very indigenous, ingenious approach to uh, talk to people, and I think then uh, we'll be able to tell them why basic science is important, why they should follow the advice given by the scientists and environmentalists if we want to save ourselves, not this world, the world will be there, the earth will always be there, and we will, uh, I think now we are ready for the next lecture by uh, Mrs. Gupta, uh, who talk about peace, 
and the global affairs. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nautial, for setting up the stage. And you have rightly pointed out that scientific temper is very important. It's the basic block of any civilization, any society. And we as a scientist have to play an important role in science communication. And there is another aspect that, uh, that the next speaker is also going to talk about uh, scientific temper and how the uh, journalist or media people can reach to grassroots society and connect the scientists uh, with uh, the uh, with the common man so uh, we have kanika she's she's independent journalist from new delhi but she primarily works from Kab out of Ka kashmir and kabul her reporting niche includes uh, human rights child rights, women rights, humanitarian issues, and culture stories from conflict zones. So you would have all, uh, mainly seen male journalists covering uh, conflict zones. And today you are going to meet a person, a female, who, who works in conflict zones and tries to bring out uh, you know, hard-hitting stories from the ground to us. So Kanika did her initial education um, in BA English Honours and then followed by Masters in Journalism and Mass Communication. And uh, she would be telling some of her stories and how, how, uh, how from her experience she would, she would like to connect the scientific temper in meeting the SDGs. Over to you, Kanika. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kanika Gupta, and uh, I really appreciate a very kind introduction. Um, I uh, have been working as a journalist for the last uh, about three years and uh, straight up deep dived into conflict zones because I have personally always believed that a lot of misinformation stems from, uh, from these regions because a lot of media is not able to access these areas due to conflict, due to insecurity due to continued fighting there could be number of reasons to not being able to access the regions and that is where uh, that's where most of the misinformation happens and i think this is where a scientific temper as um, as a concept plays a huge role in uh, trying to establish facts and trying to establish logic trying to establish uh, uh, you know honest uh, honest uh, uh, admission and honest uh, views of uh, what's happening on the ground so in this presentation, essentially, I am not going to talk about scientific temper because um, everyone before me has already covered it pretty much. My objective here is to share some stories from the ground and then eventually tie it down to what scientific temper eventually does and how it could be the basis for peace and uh, sustainable goals. So moving forward. So as per my understanding, to be very honest, and in, uh, in my honest admission, I would say that I wasn't even aware of what scientific temper means until I had a word with Neeti and she wanted me to come here and uh, bring uh, my views of uh, working in the field as a journalist and uh, talk about scientific temper and see how I can draw a parallel between the two. That's when I went online and did a bit of research and I found that there is a huge, um, uh, you know, similarity between how scientific tempo happens, uh, what scientific tempo means and how journalism happens on the ground. The um, attitude of mind which encourages change in outlook and behavioral patterns. So as a journalist, my objective is not here to change the way you think, but my job here is to present facts to you so that you can evaluate them objectively and make your own decisions along the way. It promotes rational thinking, stimulates objectivity and rationality. Once you have uh, learned, uh, once you have incorporated uh, scientific temper into your lives, into your daily lives, you would be able to keep, a, keep an open mind about things and will view things more objectively, which I will show in subsequent slides why that is important. I mean, to have an open mind about, uh, about scenarios, about things, about facts, about uh, all the events that are happening around you because it allows you 
to open your mind to possibilities and to see things from a clear lens rather than you know keeping a blurred vision that is that is that has been uh, you know distorted because of your absence of knowledge or absence of rationality helps in creating an environment of equality secularism democratic and universal society this point is especially important because in my in the next slides i will be talking about afghanistan majorly because that's where i worked in the last one year of uh, uh, approximately and i have seen how lack of uh, rational thinking and lack of scientific temper what it can do to to societies and how as indians because it is our uh, it, it is our constitutional duty that we must at any point and every point incorporate scientific temper and its tenets into our day to day lives um establishing uh, scientific temper at the grassroots levels of society so i think this is my job as a journalist to take the concepts of uh, scientific temper to the to the grassroots level of society and bring the change ground up because a lot of times we as people have access to technology we are able to see news we are able to read newspapers but a lot of people in rural parts of the country be it india or anywhere in the world they don't have access to these uh, technologies and they may often not hear the true version of what has actually happened they may hear it may be a hearsay or they may hear distorted mis misinformed versions of it and they may make a completely different or false perception of things so going forward i am going to be sharing a couple of stories um they are my experiences my photos my um, case studies for the stories that i did for a lot of publications and um, i will uh, sorry oops what i did um i'm going to circle back to this one so we'll straight up jump to the stories so this is a child his name is nuruddin he is 12 years old he is from the southern part of afghanistan in kandahar so i met him when i was doing a story about um, opm as uh, i don't know how many of, of you are aware but opm afghanistan produces world's 90% opm and they are the they it has been for 20 years the source of their income for their income meaning the taliban's income in fueling the insurgents in the country nuruddin is also a talib's son now their parents are in uh, now his father uh, is is also a part of the government and uh, even though the uh, formally uh, opm has been banned in afghanistan but the, the cultivation and harvesting is still happening the sale of it is still happening and nuruddin at 12 started working as um, uh, as uh, as a farmer at the age of 6 and for 6 years his formative years he has been working in the opium field and when i asked him that why are you in the fields and why are you not in the school his father said that for you education aapko islami nizam chahiye aapko islami taleem chahiye you should be educated in islam and not in uh, uh, in in studies in school in uh, uh, you know the basic uh, general education and he pulled him out of out of school and put him here in in the fields and he works for 12 hours in slaving in the in the fields and i asked him what do you want to be in the future if if your father allowed you to study what would you have become he said i want to become a teacher because teachers are wise and i don't know anything i don't know any games i don't play i don't have time to play because i am always working in the fields or i'm or i'm helping my parents in the house so this was nuruddin 12 years old from kandahar this is bibi zarmina bibi zarmina was also from kandahar and she is displaced along with her three children living uh, in kandahar city along with uh, because her uh, she lost her husband uh, to the fight due to conflict and she had been displaced from her home due to ongoing conflict between taliban and afghan national forces this fo this photograph i took right before kandahar city had fallen to um, to the taliban and these people were living in abject fear in hunger in poverty and now that that uh, taliban has formed a government in their country i don't know bibi zarmina would not be allowed to work bibi zarmina would not be allowed to go out bibi zarmina would not be allowed to access health care because women are not allowed to go without a man she doesn't have a husband she cannot marry so i don't know what's becoming of her life right now and she when i met her at this time she said we ran from our house my husband was killed in an explosion and we just ran with three clothes on our back and i have nothing but my children and a mat on which she's sitting right now i forgot his name but um, i met him at a drug ad drug addiction de addiction center avicina hospital one of the primary or leading uh, drug de addiction centers in kabul 
this man has been jobless for many years because of ongoing conflict the economic situation of the country is um, is in a, is in sh- uh, shambles the country uh, now with the taliban in power the world uh, has essentially cut all funding and uh, afghanistan's economy was 70% um, funded by international aid and now with the international aid gone a lot of these people are jobless there is no money in the country people don't have food to eat but being the 90% producer of opm they naturally have access to a lot of substance uh, a lot of uh, intoxicating substance which they have easy access to and it is very cheap needless to say these people are dealing with addiction and he is a heroin addict and uh, he got into addiction because he didn't have job he didn't have money and he has a family he has 12 people living in his house and he said they they constantly asked me for food and i didn't know how to provide them food so i created an alternate reality where i was always intoxicated and i did not have to deal with these real world problems of food of job of providing education to he's currently in avicina going through the addiction treatment and um, so he's basically lifting up his shirt here and showing me that i haven't had proper food in days and look at my rib cage even my you know my bones are sticking out so this uh, was at the de addiction center this guy is uh, nurullah and i met him in sangeen it's a district in uh, in hilmans also south afghanistan and uh, so uh, southern afghanistan is basically at the heart of taliban in, uh, taliban movement so this village every person in this village sangeen district the district's name is sangeen every person in this village basically was either a talib directly or was uh, supporting the fight with them so this person is 20 years old he had already lost his father and his brother to uh, to the to the fight uh, the american uh, sorry the american uh, army had killed his father and afghan national army had killed his brother so in retaliation he joined the insurgency and here he is showing um, a bullet uh, no sorry some some uh, no shrapnel he was hit by a shrapnel when there was one of the when afghan national army attacked uh, the, their district and he was fighting f- on the front line for the taliban and they are jobless they don't have any food to eat their their house was uh, covered in flies when i went to their house the house was covered in flies the children hadn't eaten in days they they the mother was crying she said she said i have already lost uh, two sons and a and a husband i cannot lose another son and then i asked them i said but you support the taliban why i mean if if uh, you know what what is the situation with the country why do you support them why do you fight for them fight with them then she said that um, uh, then she said that we don't care about money we don't care about food for us it is we are fighting for god and uh, that is the fight that we want to fight and i don't care uh, if uh, you know if we don't have food to eat and within the next Five minutes. She asked me to donate her money so that she can buy some food for her family. This this man is 20 years old and he doesn't have any other job. He's just basically sitting idle at home and and he believes that he did the right thing when he fought from the other side. This man is also from Hilmand. What he's holding in his hand here is um, is an improvised explosive device, also known as uh, a landmine. <clears throat> he fought also for the taliban uh, when the war was raging this was in hilmand district of afghanistan uh, hilmand province of afghanistan and he was i asked him i said why are you fighting from the side of taliban and he said uh, and sorry why aren't you a soldier and why are you making landmines this 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 is destructive and he said our our uh, our leaders told us that this is holier than being a soldier if you are making landmines so i decided to do this because this is this i this by if i die because of this then i will straight away go to heaven so i want to be contributing in a much holier way so i'm making landmines so i asked him okay what is how much destruction can this landmine cause and he was very proud when he told me that if it's perfectly made it can blow up a police ranger very easily this man he is 17 he's a ch- he's a boy actually he's 17 and he said he can make about 50 landmines in 10 minutes this is uh, arzu she is a 10 year old girl and um, this this was my story about 
the girls' education and the ban that was imposed by the Taliban recently on education on senior girls. She is in grade six right now. Next year, she would be moving to grade seven, uh, beyond which uh, the schools have been closed for girls. And um, she fears, she worries for her future. And I asked her, what do you want to be uh, when you when you grow up? She says, I want to become a journalist. I want to... I want to face the world. I want to put my country on to the global map. And um, and I asked her, but don't you worry that uh, that the Taliban has taken away your right for right of education? And uh, she said, well, I, it, it baffles me that uh, these men want us to take, uh, you know, want their wives to uh, be treated by a woman doctor. They want their girls to be treat, uh, taught by a woman teacher, but they don't, then they don't let us study. So I don't understand what's going to happen to this country. But for, for further notice, the education for senior girls has been banned in Afghanistan, and um, she doesn't know what's going to happen next year. So I'm circling back to this scientific temper in journalism. So what I have shown to you are very, very extreme cases. I mean, I'm very happy that none of this is applicable to India. And uh, and I really, really hope that it should never be the case in any country that we know. These are extremely extreme cases. But at the same time, we can see that the 20 years that this country was free, well, in a way, 20 years that this country was a republic, they had not incorporated the tenets of logical thinking. They had not freed themselves from the clutches of uh, uh, blind belief. They had not given their people the freedom or the ability to act objectively. And therefore, the society, when it transitioned from one phase to another, is currently grappling to find a strong footing in the society. All its people are right now struggling to stay, to, to, to stay afloat. 90% of guns are going to slide into poverty this year. 97%, that's like almost all of its population is going to slide into uh, poverty this year. And all of this was avoidable, if not completely possible to eradicate. It was avoidable to an extent if the country was given proper education, if there was access to education at the rural level, uh, uh, if there was um, access to, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, there was exposure to different kind of opportunities to girls, they would have contributed equally in, this, in the development of the country. Girls, when uh, the statistics um, say that when you remove girls in Afghanistan, especially if you remove girls from from the uh, from the field uh, uh, from the employment, basically you are removing at least five percent of the GDP. This is exactly the facts. These are the facts, hard cold facts, staring the Talibs in the face, and yet they refuse to look at them. They refuse to acknowledge them. They refuse to incorporate these facts into their strategy uh, strategies and strategic thinking which obviously is going to be a big roadblock in dialogue, in development of peace, in reaching any kind of uh, solution with countries across the world. So my point here is, as I said, we are not, we are not uh, Afghanistan, and India is a very progressive country. We know we have achieved a lot. And just today, when I was taking a walk around this campus, I was feeling excessively proud of how far as a nation we have come and how much opportunities our women have that they are able to contribute, make some serious contributions in the fields of science and so many fields across uh, across the board. And but. We had that opportunity because we were given those exposures where we could go outside and educate ourselves and to, um, you know, to uh, equip ourselves with that understanding so that we can contribute across the board. But these girls have not been uh, given that opportunity. These people have not been given this opportunity. So removing scientific temper from your, from your way of life basically can can be one of the quickest ways to take the society down, as is very evident in this case. Um, so I think as a journalist, my job, uh, when, when it comes to scientific temper, my job is to help society develop a viewpoint where they are able to think more objectively, see the facts, and decide for themselves how do they want to assess a situation and how do they want to evaluate it. It's not my job to tell you one way or another whether it is right or wrong. It's not. My job is to give you facts. My job is to tell you the truth. My job is to give you the story as is. As I see, I tell you. And then it is up to you as a reader, as a viewer, to make your own decisions, to make your own conclusions from it. Journalism helps in promotion of scientific temper in social agenda. A traditional society with low literacy and where customs and beliefs prevail, mass communication can be an effective tool. 
in traditional society, for instance, in India, if we say that, um, you know, where uh, there is no, not enough access to media, as in other channels of media, for example, social media, or television, or uh, or internet. So in these cases, journalists can be a very, very important tool in providing grass uh, information at the grassroots level, authentic grass to, uh, information at the grassroots level, which can be done. For example, in Afghanistan, a lot of um, uh, a lot of news happens. Actually, a lot, a lot of announcements and news is you is spread across the people through masjids and uh, through radios. I mean, if they don't have access to television, these are the two very, very effective mediums. And of course, through local journalists who uh, who co work closely with the village elders who eventually end up uh, taking the news or the information to people as in the first source, first hand source of information that helps remove the, um, you know, the element of misinformation that can create panic and uh, that can create false sense of information amongst people. Growth of science uh, communication is linked to scientific advancement. Uh, general awareness at grassroots level establishes scientific temper. Naturally, if you are creating awareness, it goes without saying that you will have a certain level of rational thinking because now you are uh, made aware of all the facts that there are. And with all the information in front of you, you would be able to make right decision or right assessment of the, uh, of the situation. Stimulates objectivity and rationality and helps in the environment of equality, secularism, democratic and universal society. I think at, at, at the end of the day, the, the main objective of, uh, of uh, scientific temper is to create a society that is pluralistic, that allows everyone to live in absolute harmony, that, that creates a sense of tolerance amongst us because once we are able to see the differences and acknowledge them and, and accept them, as uh, part of the society, I, I it, it just fits perfectly. So this is where my presentation ends. I'm going to fast forward to this. Any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. It takes its emotional toll. But uh, job of science, one of the jobs which you have not mentioned is asking pertinent and specific questions. Correct. So I'm asking you one. Sure. <laughs> Do you think Indian mainstream media is actually living up to that? No, sir. It's it's I, I it's I'm I am a journalist. I'll speak the truth. No, it's not. And it is. To my great despair that um, we are not following uh, the principles of journalism as it should be. It's very opinionated. Uh, from, uh, according to me, the journalism in India that is being practiced is very opinionated and that's not how it should be. Our job is to just show what it is and then it's up to you to see how you, know, how you want to see things. So the next question comes, is there any way out actually? Are you seeing any, any light at the end of the tunnel? Sir, I think as, uh, so this is where also your uh, job as uh, someone equipped with scientific temper would be to not just take your, take your information from only one source. As a journalist, I would request, you, request all of you to, when you're reading an important piece of information and you doubt its veracity, please always read multiple sources. Try and find, uh, ideally, oops. In an ideal world, it's, uh, no, no news publication should take a side, but if you feel that it is lopsided, if you read and you find the news item to be lopsided, please read at least three or four other news items to get a complete balanced view. I think that is the strategy I use at least to, be, to make sure that I know for sure that it is not biased. And other than that, I would say that uh, always try to read a neutral publication. Like if you're reading an Indian publication, it is most likely going to favor the Indian side of, uh, of it all. And if you're reading, let's say, a publication from Pakistan about an issue in India, then you will obviously see a negative side of it all. So see if there is a neutral publication that will, for instance, a global, I, I always write for global publications, by the way, I have barely contributed anything to Indian media for the very reason that I was asked multiple times to tweak my stories to suit the narrative, which I, which was not acceptable to me. And, um, and I, I made a conscious decision of not uh, rubbing them the wrong side and uh, choosing my clients um, outside of India. And where I have plenty of opportunity to be fair and um, objective in my reporting. Thank you, sir, for your question. Yes. Uh, 
So how is the agriculture productivity in Afghanistan? Sir, I, uh, agriculture is the main source of uh, um, their uh, income uh, because uh, agriculture is 70 per 85% of Afghanistan is agriculture based. So the productivity is good. Uh, they have very handsome productivity, but the problem is economics. They don't have systems in place where uh, they could, earlier the exports used to happen, they, 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 were, they were making money through its exports, and uh, of course the local produce was being sold across the country as well, but uh, with all these systems now uprooted following obviously uh, the coming of uh, the Taliban. So the current situation with, the, and, oh, of course, and there are parts of the country where there has been official uh, drought declaration. So there are basically, since it's a huge country, some parts have shown good uh, good uh, produce, and there are other parts of the country where there's complete drought. Uh, for example, in the north, in the northwestern part of the country, there has been complete drought. So there's a lot of displacement happening there. There's zero uh, uh, production agricultural produce, and um, that's also one of the issues that the country is grappling with. In fact, statistics say that there has been more displacement caused because of drought than due to war and conflict. So that's the current situation with uh, with its agricultural produce. So, so you know about uh, this, you know, op opium yes. agriculture. Yes. So, are these people aware about, you know, the uh, uh, poppy variety, which is more suited for, uh, you know, a medicine rather than a drug? Uh, to be honest, sir, I'm not aware. Uh, but that's a very interesting point, and uh, I don't think it has ever been researched. Its possibilities have ever been researched outside of. Uh, you know, the like, drug money. Like uh, if you increase the Theban content in poppy, mm -hmm. then actually such poppy will be acceptable for open cultivation and will be very, very helpful for, you know, making painkillers, right? Okay. So, so you are not aware. I'm not of aware of that. Sorry, my apologies. But I do know that I'm very, but I'm one, sure of one thing that it has, the possibilities of it have not been explored. Because the whole time that I was working on this story about opium, never did I come across any such thing associated with medical purposes of opium. So, so more more money for drug rather than you know medicine. Yes. Okay. Okay. But thanks for doing this and showing all these. Thank things. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Kanika, for answering questions out of your expertise. Generalist, uh, generally, they ask questions. They do not answer questions. So she has done a good job. Hmm? And in journalism, you may not like to be opinionated. But in science, we like to be opinionated. Hmm? You put forward something, somebody else works on that. Before I go ahead, please give me five minutes. Uh, I'm excited to talk about something, uh, what Dr. Nautial talked about, that we should carry science wherever we can. This started long back in class 11 when we read about uh, uh, something called scientific principle. You might have read about it in your textbooks, scientific principle and scientific temper which says that uh, do it this way, first do this, then do this, then do this, and ultimately this is how you prove it, or how to develop scientific temper. So that, I always say even to the students, that carry it with you, do not accept what is not proven. Because you are scientists, you should not accept it without logic. And in the same line, carrying science to the society, to the rural area, wherever we can, I'll just uh, uh, cite two very small incidences. One of our uh, neighbors, uh, he had stroke. A young boy, uh, 28 years old, he developed stroke. And uh, obviously he was taken to hospital and uh, um, some tests were done and he was told to undergo surgery. And obviously surgery is not an easy thing to accept. So uh, they were wandering around and uh, he happened to talk to me. Uh, yes, I, I am not a surgeon, but uh, when I looked at his tests, I found that his vitamin B12 level was very, very low. So what I suggested him that uh, you give me your blood sample, I would like to have one test on you. I looked for MTHFR gene mutation in him and I found that he was homozygous for MTHFR677C2T mutation. 
what happens because of this disturbance in one carbon cycle metabolism uh, the red blood cells they are not that healthy because of which the number falls and the corpuscular size that increases and ultimately these can get stuck somewhere in fine capillaries giving rise to a condition like stroke so i brought him uh, here in lucknow on my expenses he was a poor guy and i uh, consulted a doctor in pgi and i showed him the dna report and it was concluded that he can take vitamin b12 capsules for a few days until his levels are normal and uh, it has been 7 years now he has not undergone any surgery and every 6 months he gets his b12 measured and takes b12 whenever necessary this was one small incident so where you can take science to the rural uh, there is one more but anyway let's begin the next session <laughs> Uh, uh regarding sustainable development uh, we not only need it outside but we also need it in science that is why we have dedicated this session to the sustainable development in scientific uh, ecosystem uh, so that we can prepare budding scientists for tomorrow and for this uh, we have dedicated the session to the students to the young scientists and uh, the session will be moderated by maybe a relatively old young scientists uh we have six presentations lined up uh, uh in this session uh, the first one in this is contribution of basic sciences in health and well being uh, which is to be uh, taken care by anuradha and tuba from cdri it will be moderated by dr arun trivedi arun dr arun trivedi uh, is our colleague at cdri working in the area of cancer particularly on the uh, uh underlying uh, uh, patho mechanisms in breast cancer and uh, in uh, acute myeloid leukemia he is a recipient of young scientist award from insa in the year 2013 arun over to you Oh, right. hello thank you rajendra for this uh, nice introduction uh, so in this session uh, which is research scholar session uh, we would like to start up the session with uh, research scholars from this very institute central drug research institute and uh, first speaker which is like you know the set up speakers are anuradha and tuba kamar anuradha is a senior research scholar and tuba is a project assistant both are working in the division of microbiology and uh, molecular immunology under the guidance of dr susanta kar they are working on leishmaniasis and they will be giving their talk on contribution of basic sciences to health and well being i welcome them on the stage yours anuradha and toba thank you sir for the warm introduction Uh, good afternoon everyone present here i am anuradha i am tuba we and are here to present our views on the topic contribution of basic science to human health and well being in the following video presentation we will present before you a series of breakthrough discoveries that have benefited the human race and led to the sustainable development टीवी नहीं चल रहा है ना Okay, uh, the United Nations and the UNESCO has jointly proposed to organize the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development in the year 2022, and this is a unique opportunity for us to connect the links uh, that connect uh, basic sciences with sustainable development. And these SDGs are 17 globally recognized goals designed for a better tomorrow. 
Achieving all 17 SDGs require the considerable input of curiosity driven basic research. For example, SDG 3, good health and well being, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, and protection of all life forms. One of the biggest contributions of science in this regard has been in the effective conversion of energy in its usable form from harnessing wind power to generating electricity from water in motion. If I were to ask you that what is the most important contribution that basic science has made to the human advancement, what would you say? I would say it's fire. Harnessing its power gave us the warmth to survive harsh winters and to cook food which nourished us. Our ability to control fire is attributed to John Walker's discovery of strikeable matches, who invented them as a way to reduce fossil jaw, an occupational health hazard that crippled the lives of female match workers in the early 1800s. Well, besides fire, water is another basic need of the human consumption. Though it comprises of 70% of water, but that too it is bracket faulty in nature. But thanks to the concept of river osmosis that led to the establishment of RO power plant and making the water fit for the human consumption and thus aiding in the waste water management. While clean water is essential for human survival, so is electricity. And today it is a staple part of every home. But in the early 1700s, uh, the only known sources of electricity were stingrays and lightning. Uh, but that provoked the curiosity of researchers who gave us electric motors and incandescent light bulbs, eventually making the shift to more renewable forms of energy like LED lighting, electric cars, turbines and hydropower. Uh, but then Maxwell came along and he first connected electricity with magnetism, giving rise to the creation of instruments that transmit radio waves like microwave, television and radio telescopes, which went on to aid in the discovery of the Saturn rings. Well, besides basic amenities, another indicator of well-being is the absence of disease. And if one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is the importance of good health. And Louis Pasteur's junk theory of disease has greatly enhanced our understanding of how disease arises. Shortly after Fleming's discovery of penicillin from mole contaminants of his bacterial cultures led to mass production of this first antibiotic that was given as a treatment to wounded soldiers of the World War II, saving countless lives followed by Waxman's isolation of streptomycin, the very first effective treatment for tuberculosis. And all of these uh, kick-started a whole new era of antibiotics that led to better management of bacterial infections like meningitis and pneumonia. Well, besides infection, the human body is also ravaged by many kind of illnesses that arises from within, that is due to malnutrition. And many researchers have found the link between the illness and deficiencies in diet and soon after vitamin B and C were isolated. Today, multivitamins are produced at large scale and are used as a supplement for improving the health of the expected mother, elder and children alike. Some other interventions that improve the health of the children are pasteurization of milk and administration of ORS. And speaking of well-being in children, another factor that is markedly contributed to reducing childhood mortality is vaccination. And today vaccines are mass produced owing to decades of efforts by researchers Edward Jenner, Louis Pasteur and Jonas Salk. And it is their concepts of heat attenuated vaccines that have led to a global reduction in the disease burden of anthrax, measles, mumps and rabies. Just like disease prevention, disease diagnosis is equally important. And today, MRI, X-rays and CT scan have emerged as a powerful tool for the diagnosis of breast cancer and brain stroke in a non-invasive manner. And William Roentgen and Marie Curie have championed the use of radiation therapy for treating cancer. And today, X-rays can be used 
to visualize everything from body scanning to the very first photograph of DNA structure. Another powerful biomedical research tool is lasers and they arose from Max Planck's quantum theory of light. And today lasers have inspired a flood of activity from laser printing to scanning barcodes, destroying tumor cells to correcting vision. Yet these technologies merely arose from a basic understanding of fundamental nature of atomic particles, matter and energy. And today it is Heisenberg and Bohr's concepts of quantum physics that have given rise to the transistors, which went from being a semiconductor with three connections to an integral building block of the microchip making our smartphones slim and lightweight today. Transistors have now replaced large vacuum tubes that were first used in the first generation computer, making a wireless laptop a reality today. And thus ensuring the proper connectivity over the social media. And if I talk about the wireless connectivity, none of it would be possible without the Albert Einstein theory of connectivity that gave birth to satellite communication helping in the GPS based uh, monitoring and helping us financial access to the ATM and making the world more connected than ever before. And the notion of connecting people and technology around the globe originally dates back to Tesla's experiments with sending wireless radio signals that have now built the foundation for the modern day communication that is the 5G network. And collectively it is these concepts of electricity, semiconductor devices and mathematical computing that have given rise to technological advances like 3D printing, quantum computing, uh, artificial intelligence, which has been used to engender sustainable development in various forms from the control of prosthetic limbs to farmland monitoring for better crop management, visualization of 3D protein structures, as well as personalized app usage. At the time of these discoveries, these scientists saw their work as simply solving a problem on their bench. But sometimes it's both the beauty and the pain of the research that the results aren't realized until years or even decades later. But we can be comforted with the fact that our research or even our failures can be used to expand our understanding of the world that we live in, which is the starting point of every sustainable development. And as the saying goes, the science of today is the technology of tomorrow. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That has given rise to technology. Okay. Okay. Uh, everyday uses. Maybe the microwave that we saw in this presentation, that is an application of uh, uh, radio waves and uh, the electromagnetic theory of light, uh, which Hertz used to... Right, fermentation. Okay, thank you very much thank to you, both sir. of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Right. Some of these scientific concepts, they in fact existed uh, uh, before we understood science, as Dr. Nautial pointed out. I was just discussing that case. So when I went back to the family history of that boy, I found that uh, they had consanguineous marriage in their family, at least in three generations, because of which the homozygosity was so common that he was homozygous even for the most heterozygous uh, locus in the genotype. So being uh, married within the same clan, that is why in Indian system, even before we could understand science, most of the uh, people, they practiced not marrying within their clan so that they, they can bring in more heterozygosity in the genome. This is how uh, we apply science and we were applying science even before we could actually understand the real scientific logic behind that. Uh, the next team uh, uh, making presentation is uh, Anuradha Singh and uh, Deepsi Chaurasia from Indian Institute of Toxicology Research. 
the title is Gearing Research Towards Clean Water and Sanitation, uh, being moderated by Dr. Silendra P. Singh. Dr. Singh? Uh, Dr. Singh uh, is working as a scientist at uh, the IITR Lucknow with particular interests in genobiotic metabolism, pharmacokinetics, and toxicokinetic area. And uh, he was elected to be a member of INEAS, that is Young Scientists Academy of INSA, in the year uh, 2022. Over to you, Dr. Singh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayanda, for the introduction. Uh, so now, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, we are moving to the session on the gearing research toward clean water and sanitation. We have uh, Anuradha Singh and Dipsi Chaurasia from CSI Indian Institute of Toxicology Research. Uh, they both are working with uh, Dr. Piti Chaturvedi in the area of uh, water quality assessment. And they both have worked on very important projects uh, from government of India, like Namami Gam Gange, Ganga Amantran Abhiyan. And presently, they are working on like uh, groundwater quality uh, assessment, where they are looking for uh, like physiochemical characterization and microbiological characterization of the water sample. With this, you can uh, start the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the warm introduction. A very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Deepshi, and the topic for our presentation is gearing research towards clean water and sanitation. As we all know that clean water and sanitation is one of the most important sustainable development goals. And why it shouldn't be? It be because it is uh, the access to clean water and sanitation is an essential commodity for every living being. Water, which is an indispensable component, As we all know that water, which is an indispensable component for the survival, is facing it uh, as a result of its overexploitation. It is facing not only scarcity, but degradation in its quality. And, uh, and where there are numerous studies which have been conducted, which have reported the presence of various harmful and toxic compounds like antibiotics, dyes, heavy metals in the water. And uh, in addition to this, the water scarcity issue is also very known. And recently, uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji has also addressed the issue in his latest broadcasted monkey uh, program, Monkey Bath, in which he has highlighted the important. Uh, he has laid emphasis on water conservation, and he has also mentioned about the various water conservation activities that has been followed by various tribes in their uh, in the various states. Now, the con it's not like that uh, the, uh, that we, the general public is unaware about the presence of these contaminants. And the facilities available in any country may, uh, are utilizing their full facilities for treating the wastewater by different conventional techniques. But the techniques are not com uh, do not provide complete removal of these uh, compounds. And as a result, their traces are also detected in river water. And as river water is very much accessible to humans and animals to meet their daily needs, the presence of these compounds imparts toxic negative effects on ecosystem. Moreover, the advanced techniques which are also available, they are associated with high operation cost, they, and uh, they require high energy consumption, and also the process is also complex. Thus, in order to achieve a sustainable solution to it, we we address the uh, we address the problem by suggesting the solution of biochar now what is biochar biochar is any such component which is obtained from organic waste through the process of pyrolysis pyrolysis involves the thermochemical decomposition of organic waste into biochar in an oxygen absence environment the biochar has some suit, uh, appropriate properties which makes it a suitable adsorbent and help us in uh, reducing the contaminants from the wastewater. There, as you can see in the slide, the various lignocellulosic biomasses that has been used for the, process, for the production of biochar and the properties which render biochar a suitable adsorbent. That is, its large surface area, its high porous structure, its magnetic properties, and its reusability and various other properties. Now, how biochar uses its properties to remove the contaminant is like by bonding it through various interactions like electrostatic attraction, pipe uh, pore filling, pi pi electron donor acceptor interactions, hydrogen bonding, and etc. Thus, biochar can be suggested as a uh, suitable solution to meet the uh, goal, sustainable development goal of clean water and sanitation. Now, my uh, teammate, Ms. Anuradha, will further explain how we explore these characteristics of biochar in treating the wastewater. Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन जैसा कि हम सभी जानते हैं कि जो इंडस्ट्रीज होती है वो जैसा कि हम सभी जानते हैं कि जो हमारी इंडस्ट्रीज है वो सबसे ज्यादा डाइज का यूज करती है जैसे कि फूड इंडस्ट्री हो गया टेक्सटाइल हो गया पेंट हो गया इन सारी जगहों पे डाइज का अमाउंट बहुत ज्यादा यूज होता है जिसका डिग्रेडेशन पॉसिबल नहीं होता है क्योंकि इनके कॉम्प्लेक्स स्ट्रक्चर्स होते हैं और वो केमिकली ज्यादा एक्टिव होता है इसलिए उसका डिग्रेडेशन इजली नहीं हो पाता है कन्वेंशनल ट्रीटमेंट के मेथड से इसलिए हमने इस यहाँ पे बायोचार का यूज किया था डिग्रेडेशन करने के लिए सिंथेटिक डाई सिंथेटिक डाई के बहुत सारे साइड इफेक्ट्स होते हैं जो कि ह्यूमन के लिए और टॉक्सिक इन्वायरमेंट पैदा करते हैं वाटर में बायोचार को हमने बनाया था लिग्नोसोलोलॉजिक बायोमास है जिसमें काउडंक और हमने राइस हस्क लिया था काउडंक और राइस हस्क दो लिग्नोसोलोलॉजिक बायोमास है जो कि एज अ वेस्ट इन्वायरमेंट में होते हैं इनका ये हमें इजीली मिल अवेलेबल होते हैं और ये बहुत ही लो प्राइस में हमें मिल जाते हैं इनका हमने पैरोलिसिस किया था पैरोलिसिस पैरोलिसिस के थ्रू हमने बायोचार बनाया था जिसमें उनमें दो बाय प्रोडक्ट्स बनते हैं बायोगैस और बायो ऑयल बायोचार का यूज हमने किया था सिंथेटिक डाई रिमूवल में जिसमें कांगोरेट डाई का यूज किया था और हमने यह देखा कि इसमें दो तरह की स्टडी कंडक्ट करी थी एक बैच स्टडी दूसरा पायलट स्केल स्टडी बैच स्टडी में हमने पी को कांस्टेंट रख के अदर वेरिएशन किए थे दूसरे में टेम्परेचर को कांस्टेंट रख के अदर वेरिएशन किए थे और तीसरे स्टडी में हमने डाई को कांस्टेंट रख के वेरिएशन किया था और बायोचार को कांस्टेंट कांस्टेंट रख के वेरिएशन किया था इसमें हमने बायोचार का प्री और पोस्ट ट्रीटमेंट के बाद इनकी स्टडी करी थी जिसमें असैम बैट और एफ किया था और सी एच किया था इसमें हमने ये पाया कि जो बायोचार होता है वो कॉन्गो रेड डाई को एब्जॉर्ब करता है जिसमें पीएच साबन बेस्ट होता है एब्जॉर्बेशन के लिए जिसमें 80 टू 90 परसेंट एब्जॉर्बेशन होता है और हमने ये भी देखा कि जो हमारा टाइम ड्यूरेशन होता है वो 84 फोर आवर होता है जिसमें सबसे ज्यादा रिमूवल होता है कॉन्गो रेड डाई का थ्रू बायोचार जिसमें मोस्टली 60 से लेके 60 से लेके 98 परसेंट नाइन्टी परसेंट तक का रिमूवल देखा गया है इससे हमें ये पता चलता है कि जो हमारा बायोचार होता है उसको हम लार्ज स्केल पे यूज कर सकते हैं वेस्ट ट्रीटमेंट में बायोचार का यूज हम करने पे हमारे दो एम हो जाते हैं एक तो वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट इसलिए भी जरूरी है क्योंकि वेस्ट जनरेशन बहुत ज्यादा हो रहा है और उसका मैनेजमेंट प्रॉपर तरीके से नहीं हो पा रहा है जिसकी वजह से एनवायरनमेंट uh, में बहुत सारी डिजीजेस हो रही हैं और उससे बहुत सारी प्रॉब्लम्स होती हैं और कहीं ना कहीं वो वॉटर में भी पार्टिसिपेट करता है वॉटर को वॉटर uh, में वो चला जाता है और वॉटर ब्लॉकिंग का काम करता है इसलिए वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट भी हो रहा है और इसके थ्रू हम अगर वेस्ट का रिमूवल कर देते हैं वाटर से तो वो वाटर हम कहीं ना कहीं एग्रीकल्चर में भी यूज कर सकते हैं अदर पर्पजेस में भी यूज करते हैं और जो हमारी ग्लोबल uh, प्रॉब्लम हो रही है वाटर की कमी हो रही है चीज हर चीज में उसका भी सलूशन हमें मिल जाता है तो इसलिए हमने ये देखा है कि जो रिएक्टर बेस्ड एक्सपेरिमेंट होता है वो बहुत ही अच्छा उपाय है वेस्ट से निपटने के लिए और वेस्ट वाटर ट्रीटमेंट के लिए थैंक यू Uh, thanks for the presentation, Anuradha and Deepsi. Uh, so, is there any question from the audience? Hello. So, uh, suppose you have uh, 100 liters of uh, waste water with Congo dye, right? Yes, yes. So, how many grams of biochar actually you would be needing? For uh, clarification. Uh, sir, in this study, we have taken five grams of biochar. In which we have removed it with 100 ppm of biochar. It was the Congo red dye, which we have removed. We have also removed it with 5 liters. We have made a 5 liter solution, which we have removed. So, with 5 grams of dye, we can remove the solution with 5 liters of biochar with 100 ppm. If the ppm concentration increases, तो हमारा जो अमाउंट होगा वो कम हो जाएगा और उसका कंसेंट्रेशन अगर कम होता है तो अमाउंट हमारा ज्यादा हो जाएगा हैव यू स्टडीड कांगो डाई यू नो कंसेंट्रेशन इन इन वेस्ट वाटर जी सर इट इज आल्सो रिपोर्टेड इन अ रिसर्च पेपर 
So how much? It is 150 ppm. Yes. Okay. And then, uh, did you try many things before boiling down to rice straw and cow dung? Yes, sir. So what sir, kind? Uh, sludge biochar we have used. Sludge ka bhi kiya hai. Aur bhi, uh, matlab, wo, food products aur bhi hai, jisme, uh, bananas ka bhi used. Sir, basically Uska... we have used three, the sludge biochar, the cow dung and the rice stuff. And our study is going on with further lignocellulose waste that can be explored for use as biochar. So do you think that the presence of silica in rice was helpful in doing this kind of uh, removal? Sir, we are not uh, mm -hmm. sure about it, but uh, we will definitely uh, Look into this aspect of, this, of the rice culture. Okay. And you said that the maximum removal happened after 80 hours, if I am correct. 84 hours. So why after 84 hours only? Or if the process of adsorption is very slow and it got completed around 80 hours? The process, I think, requires some more modification and more uh, addition of such components that can make the process uh, as fast. My question is different. Why this removal hap removal happened continuously yes, and yes. continued and finished by 80 hours? No, or no we uh, scheduled the removal at the different times. But at 84 hours, the best removal uh, efficiency was obtained. Sir. Otherwise, for if you incubate for shorter period, lesser will be removed. Yes, sir. So yes, different sir. variations are there in the graph, sir. But okay. at 84 hours, we achieved the maximum removal, sir. Okay, because you need... A very efficient or fast system, uh, right? Yes, maximum uh, dyes can get absorbed to it and the uh, concentration of the uh, dye in the water is reduced. Your your aim should be online kind of removal situation, like yes. water is coming yes. and it is treated and water becomes free of fungo dye. Yes, sir, we are still sir, uh, standardizing the protocol. Okay, so that good. Very interesting talks, Anuradha and Anuradha. Okay. Both the teams had Anuradha as the first speaker. Uh, just again, the role of basic sciences uh, in health, water, and sanitation. Uh, you may have heard about Dr. Samelvis, a Hungarian obstetrician uh, who first said, Wash your hands. The third uh, three words was your hands that can reduce infections drastically and uh, he was known to be an outspoken uh, spoken doctor and uh, as far as i remember if my memory is correct even a case was filed against him that what you are saying just doesn't make any sense so uh, later he demonstrated that in the world where he was working versus others in other words, there was a rate of 17% of death due to childbed. And the patients in that country, they said that we would like to deliver on the road rather than getting admitted to their wards because of very high death rate. And uh, Dr. Samelvis, uh, he introduced wash your hands and the infection rate was drastically reduced. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Samelvis himself died of uh, infection uh, I think some 20, 25 years later. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, we have the third talk from NBRI by Rudra and uh, Sanchita. Uh, they are talking on strengthening research for preserving biodiversity. Uh, this is to be moderated by Dr. Dibendu Adhikari. Dr. Dibendu. Dr. Dibendu is principal scientist as at National Botanical Research Institute, Lucknow. He has interests in environmental science and forest ecology with a specific interests in technology development for restoration of degraded forests and conservation of threatened species and control of invasive plants. Over to you, uh, Dr. Adhikari, for this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir for the warm uh, introduction. Now, I, I would like to um, call upon the stage, uh, Rudra and Sanchita. So, to introduce them briefly. Ah, Rudra, one minute. Rudra is working as a project associate in plant genetic resources and improvement. He works on plant insect interaction, chemical ecology, and plant association under Dr. Asenjena. 
and Sanchita Singh is uh, working as a project associate in plant molecular biology. Uh, he, she also works uh, on plant uh, pestin drop interactions under Dr. Praveen Verma. So their talk is strengthening research efforts for preserving biodiversity. Over to you, Rudra and Sanchita. Yeah. Thank you very much and it's so good to see you, such a big audience after the lunch. Usually we do not expect this kind of audience after the lunch, but hopefully we will be able to justify what we are presenting right now. So yeah, good evening everyone. Uh, we are so happy to hear and today we will be talking about biodiversity and uh, how research efforts can help in strengthening biodiversity research at a local scale as well as at the global scale. So let's start. Uh, there might be some technical difficulties because we have some videos and interactive audios and please kindly bear with us for that. Hello everyone, to start with, I will be talking about uh, biodiversity. So, Rudra has explained the concept of biodiversity. Now, why there is a need of biodiversity preservation? Uh, biodiversity which planet is required for proper functioning of an ecosystem and why we require a properly functional ecosystem because ecosystem offers us immense number of services. Now to further give you a deeper insight on the ecosystem service, I would like to, I would like you all to focus on the two videos. So video number one is showing you the heartbeat of, uh, yeah. video number one is showing you the heartbeat of honeybee from a low polluted area and video number two is showing you the heartbeat of honeybee from a highly polluted area and you can see there is a very clear difference in the rhythm of the two and this difference is due to the accumulation of heavy metals in the one which is residing in the area with um, high pollution. Now why we are talking about honeybees because honeybees are the major pollinators and 80% of our crop plants are pollinated by bees. Now this is can you imagine a situation where there is no honeybee such scenarios can reduce the population of honeybee of an area. And now imagine a situation where there is no honeybee. Now this is just one example. And this is just one organism. As we are speaking right now, right here, there are many thousands of organisms which are fighting for their existence. Now imagine the magnitude of the problem we are facing. The bar graph at the bottom is showing you the uh, current scenario of insect population. And there is a decrease by 41% in the past 10 years. So, as you can see, biodiversity is not uniformly distributed across the globe, right? So, what you can see in this figure is uh, the tropical region is much more biodiversity rich as compared to the other parts of the globe. And especially if you particularly look at Indian context, then you can see that Northeast and the Western Ghats are, uh, are having those red patches, which basically means that those regions are rich in biodiversity. But it also gives you an opportunity to think of if those regions are biodiversity rich, then you probably have the threat of losing those biodiversity in that area also. What are the threats that we are facing currently? So we have climate change, we have habitat loss, we have pollution, invasive species, so on and so forth. So just to give you a quantitative estimation of that, IUC has proposed a very nice data set where they have said that nearly 40,000 of species are threatening and they are going to face extinction in the next few years. So just to accumulate it all, it gives you a 28% of the, all the species which has been accessed in IUC database. So this is quite threatening and we need to come up with strategies of how to save the planet. Now what we can do as a part of scientific community, how we can contribute to the solution of the problem? A very assuring uh, answer is following the sustainable development. Now we really need to reorient our research in such a way that sustainable development becomes the central idea of the research. For that, uh, here we are proposing few strategies and few studies with uh, the goals they are targeting. Right. So the first one is Earth Biogenome Project. Uh, we know that some of you might have heard about this ambitious project, which is a collaborative global project where there is a basic aim of sequencing all the eukaryotic organisms in our planet. Now, if you have the sequence of the organism in your hand, then you can easily tell the evolutionary relationship of those organisms from the past and the present. And as well as you can also solve issues related to the medicine, related to the health and food crisis. So this project is really an essential component of uh, protecting biodiversity. Then second, uh, you have One Health. One Health is also a global approach. So the basic aim of One Health is to work on infectious diseases, just like Ebola, COVID and all. So these infectious diseases get transmitted from the wildlife to the human because of the spillover. So One Health basically works on the wildlife and the human population and how these diseases get transmitted. So if you have an idea of this transmission, then you can easily 
come up with the strategies of how to stop those diseases from coming in contact with the human. So this is a famous paper which shows that how climate change and temperature rise can have effect on the virus load. And this is where One Health can come and actually help us to mitigate this kind of problem. Then you have carbon drawdown. Now we all are talking about climate change, right? Now, in order to mitigate that climate change problem, you have to sequester the carbon dioxide, which is already accumulated in the atmosphere. Now, who are the best players to solve that? Of course, plants. But you cannot just plant a single plant without knowing the physiology of it, right? So how much carbon does the plant sequester? What are the conditions that are required for the plant to grow in that region? So to answer those questions, a global consortium has developed where scientists have come up with strategies to know how much quantity of carbon does a plant can fix. And with the help of these, people can actually really see that which plant species best fit to which environmental condition. So this is a famous paper which has been published in Nature, which shows these kind of activities. And the sustainable development goals which are associated with carbon drawdown are in your screen. Now, smart farming. 80% of uh, deforestation is caused due to agriculture activities. So there is a definite need of changing our approach towards agriculture. So what we can do, this is where smart farming comes in picture. So following smart farming, what we can do is we, we really need to combine the conventional agriculture approaches with technological advances. And with that, uh, we can, uh, there, there are many labs all over the world, including the labs of NBRI, which are working on plant responses towards different stress. And a huge data is generated in this field. And this data can further be combined with AI and machine learning for development of tools, which are of direct benefit to the farmers. Then a very uh, promising uh, field of smart farming is uh, indoor farming. So we really need to strengthen this area as indoor farming requires lesser amount of uh, water, lesser land, and the reduce is pesticide free. This is the set of goals which can be achieved following this. Next is basic research. A lot is yet to be explored in the area of basic research. What we can do is we can combine two different disciplines like the ecological data can be further combined with the plant systematics data for, uh, for addressing e global issues like thermal infertility. And through this, this is the set of goals which can be achieved. Now let's talk about substitution. Substitution is a very promising approach. It's a vi very wide approach. So uh, this uh, paper is a very recent and very interesting paper. And they have claimed that by replacing 20% of beef consumption with microbial protein, we can achieve uh, by the year 2050, there can be a decline in deforestation by a percentage of 50. And this is the set of goals which can be achieved through this approach. Yeah, so in order to achieve all these goals, you need public support, right? So by public support, we mean to say that you need capacity building, you need to include local people who can come and support your research. So what are the what are the possibilities by which you can do that? Number one is citizen science program. It's a very uh, important program where common people can really participate in science, even though they do not have much idea about scientific background, but they can actually they can collect data from the natural environment. They can see anything and they can upload that data in the internet. And they, that database can be easily accessible to a larger community of scientists who can use that data to come up with some models, some predictions, some patterns of how biodiversity is losing. The second objective is uh, sustainable development, which can be done with ecotourism. Ecotourism is a very interesting concept where tribal people can participate. Their income can be generated through ecotourism, and at the same time, the biodiversity of that particular area can be preserved in, in such a way. So these are some of the examples which have been proposed. So just like using citizen science to track Ill illegal trafficking of some birds in Himalaya, and you have some certain goals which can also be achieved through the citizen science program and public engagement. Now I would like to focus on NBRI. What is the role of NBRI in biodiversity preservation? NBRI, the lungs of the city, has a very huge, uh, has a very rich biodiversity, not only of plants, but also of many other organisms. As you can see on the screen, the Institute has many unique and rare collection of plants. And talking about preservation, we of course cannot overlook the psychic conservation uh, center of the institute, which is which has the largest collection of cycads in South Asia and ninth largest collection of cycads all over the world. The institute also has its own face facility. So now let's talk about what are the initiatives that has been that has been undertaken by the government of India. So just for give you an example, these are certain kind of projects or approaches that have been undertaken by the prime ministers. Uh, 
office and you have conservation of wildlife studies, NCBS, Indian Biodiversity Portal. So just to name a few, we have DBTs, conservation of threatened plants in India, which have managed to conserve the plant species which are particularly threatened in the Northeast India. Then you have Secure Himalaya project, which talks about snow leopard and turtle conservation. Uh, you also have in NBPGR, NCL, Terry, you have tissue culture repository where rare threatened plants can be conserved with the help of tissue culture. Then you have Tamil Nadu Forest Department. This is a very interesting initiative where the forest department and uh, private companies come together and they have managed to uh, recreate a uh, rainforest in the Andamalai Hills. So these are just some of the examples. There are many more. And due to time contrast, it was not possible for us to cover all of it. So we'll stop here and uh, we'll take some questions and discussion. Yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah, correct. Absolutely right. That's fantastic. So, uh, so one of the initiative what I remember is uh, is done at Meghalaya. So in Meghalaya, one of the very important keystone species is fig, you know, fig trees. Now, what they have done is they have made uh, this living root bridges out of the fig trees. So that living root bridges are being constructed in such a way that it provides sustainability to the tribal people. And it also increased the opportunity for ecotourism. So people from outside, they come, they stay on that forest region just to get a feeling of the biodiversity. And at the same time, the tribal people, by using the forest, they manufacture some very interesting handicraft things. So government of India have specially undertaken some interesting project initiative where they are actually trying to preserve the number of tree species of fig which are present and which are associated in connecting those living root bridges. So that's one of the initiatives. Yeah. Right. Not only this, I would like to highlight one more point that uh, even individuals are also participating. In Uttarakhand, there are stretches of forest which are owned by people, not by the government. And people have taken, uh, uh, people have come forward to secure uh, the tribal of that area. What they have done, they have made the ecotourism right. concept, they have picked up the ecotourism. People can... Uh, People can from uh, from the urban area of the country can come and have a feel of the forest and the, whatever uh, their requirement is food and uh, shelter whatever they require that is provided by the tribes yeah. and uh, the and so there's in this way there is a flow of money to the tribes also. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. NGO. Right. Private. Yeah. Thank you, Rosa and Sanchita. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Is it not on? It's on. Yeah, so it is about uh, uh, knowledge diversity and harnessing it to ultimately help in preserving biodiversity. Yeah, efforts are being made. And uh, uh, that takes me back to our uh, uh, BSc days. We used to read a very uh, voluminous botany book. And I remember uh, reading the names of so many plants, so many species. And we used to say, looking at the professor, why why the hell I have to remember so many names? This is grown in Himalayas, this is grown in South India, and this and there. So in case this plant is not there, how does it affect my life? It just does not affect my life because uh, I'm not at all using it anyway. But uh, uh, coming back to science, look at uh, Dr. Singh's example. Uh, he stated in the uh, uh, talk in the morning that he cloned a gene from funds to ultimately introduce resistance in cotton. So in case that gene didn't exist somewhere, how would he make good use of that to achieve something else? So that is how biodiversity is important. Say, and we all are, say, basically, you can say, uh, bioreactors, molecular, uh, uh, maybe bio factories. Say, a cow can produce milk. Uh, maybe a mango tree can make mango. Uh, you know, a karela tree, uh, uh, I mean, plant can make karela out of the same thing. Right? We, we cannot make out, uh, out of uh, any of these things. 
So this is where biodiversity plays a significant role and we must uh, uh, make efforts to preserve the gene pool in its uh, natural arrangement so that we can make a better use in the future. So our next talk is by uh, Vidusi Tyagi and uh, Niki Deepa from uh, CMAP. Uh, they are talking on scientific innovation for economic growth. And uh, the moderator is Dr. Akanksha Singh. Dr. Singh. Dr. Akanksha is a senior scientist working at uh, uh, CMAP Lucknow. She is working in the area of plant microbe interactions. And uh, uh, she is uh, uh, a young scientist awardee from INSA for the year 2021. Over to you, okay. Dr. Kangsa. Um, thank you, Dr. Rajendra, for the uh, kind introduction. And so for CMAP, we have been given a theme, scientific Uh, so, Ms. Vidushi is basically working on modulation of gut uh, immunity using bioactive molecules derived from medicinal aromatic plants. And likewise, Nikki is working on plant microbe interaction with specific emphasis on endophytes and how they modulate uh, the plant immunity and uh, the specific metabolites. So, uh, before I'm handing over the mic to you all, uh, please see to it that you stick within the time frame, that you have eight minutes time. And over to you both. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a kind introduction. A uh, very good afternoon to you all. My name is Vidushi Tyagi. And I'm Nikki Deepa. And on the behalf of CSIRC, ma'am, today we are here to present our views on the topic scientific innovation for economic growth. Arthik Vikas ke liye Vigyan mein navini karan. So, why this topic is true in its complete sense? And India is the finest example for this. Let's get back to the time during independence in 1947 when we were dependent on import in many different areas. Be it manufacturing excellence, be it industrial excellence, be it R&D and so on. But since then till now, we have come a long way where India is the largest growing economy in the world. So let's have a look on a global economic rate that has been increasing from years to years. And also, as I have mentioned previously, like we were dependent on import, but now not only the India's GDP, but the export value from India has also been increased. And what are the key reasons? What are the factors that are contributing towards India's GDP? Agricultural sector, industrial sector, and other services. So. Agriculture and industry are itself contributing towards 50% of India's GDP. What is the root cause behind increase in economic rate, not only for India, but also for globally? Innovation. Innovation in each and every different area, be it agricultural sciences, be it manufacturing sciences, be it civil, be it R&D and so on. So for India to march ahead on a sustainable development pathway, it should focus more on towards achieving a goal that has already been stated by our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, Atmanirbhar Bharat. And for that, we should work towards promoting traditional knowledge system, developing indigenous technologies, and encouraging grassroots innovations. So, on the basis, uh, there is one data that has been published by Global Innovation Index and the different countries has been ranked globally uh, on the basis of different innovation elements. Uh, Switzerland came first, while Sweden at second and USA at third. If we'll see for India, it has improved its rank from the year 2019 to 2021, that is 46. And what are the global priority areas and technologies? There are major four segments and uh, energy storage, new materials, biotech and chemicals under which different themes are there. So there are lots of innovations that can be talked about, but here I am taking a creative liberty of going with some of the innovations that had happened in India. Starting from Suraj Tractor, to first developed parallel computer flow solver, to becoming the global leader in the not only in the production, but also in the export of developed indigenous varieties of mint. 
we displaces China to the second position. And as we can see, it from an importer to the largest exporter. And as we can see, there is one positive relationship between an innovation and development where India is performing above expectation for the level of development. So for more innovations to be carried out in detail, I will hand over my mic to my colleague. Thank you, ma'am. Um, a very good afternoon, everyone. Now, um, taking a step forward and talking about various other innovations in the field of science and technology, let us uh, dive into the future of energy that is biofuels. Now, biofuels, as we all know, that these are basically hydrocarbons that have been originated from their, that has been generated from organic matter by the process of deoxygenation, selective cracking, isomerization, and fermentation. And because of its benefits, right from being sustainable to eco-friendly, it has impacted the globe in a great way. Now, globally, these biofuel producing pertaining industries, they have provided 47,400 jobs and 1.9 billion in wages have been already paid. And that is a huge impact. Now, talking about India, since uh, 2018, according to Indian policy of biofuels, India has increased its ethanol production right from 380 million liters to 3.5 billion liters in order to achieve the goal of 20% ethanol blending and 5% biodiesel blending. Now, talking about innovation, CSIR Indian Institute of Petroleum has played its way. They have generated uh, biojet fuel right from the Jatro seeds and uh, those biojet fuel has been successfully uh, tested in military aircraft and in uh, public aviation unit spice jet a great step towards atmanirbhar bharat now talking about um, yet another uh, innovation in the field of nanotechnology is carbon nanotubes carbon nanotubes these are basically allotropes of carbon that has a cylindrical shape but what's so important, what's so special about these carbon nanotubes? Now, these carbon nanotubes are known for its extraordinary qualities of being very strong, uh, very strong molecule and height and size strength. High, it has a high current carrying capacity. It has high elasticity. It has high absorbance, low weight, and most importantly, it is biocompatible. And because of its extraordinary qualities, it has impacted various sectors, right from being uh, in, in the field of plant growth for uh, biosensors, hydrogen storage, battery, even in wastewater treatment, drug targeting, and even high efficiency electrical devices formulations. And uh, because of its impact in various sectors, it now has a global market of 876 USD million, and it is it is expected, the market is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 14.4% and is now being forecasted to be 1,714 million until 2026. Now talking about uh, yet another innovation in the field of optics that uh, mainly depends, uh, it mainly based on the normal phenomena that, uh, that we would have studied, that is of total internal reflection. Now, optical fibers has given rise uh, to a new technology of fiber optics. It was first studied by Dr. Narendra Singh, uh, Narendra Singh Kampani, and he was American, uh, Indian American uh, physicist. And it is a proud moment to understand that how this optical fibers has changed the entire scenario of the world right from being uh, being applied in telecommunication, uh, from improvising infrastructure, soil sciences, military sciences, optical fibers has it all. Now the world market of optical fibers, it stands at, it stood at 4.3 uh, USD billion in 2019. And uh, if we talk about India, the optical fiber cables market is expected to grow at a rate of 19.7% and to reach 2.1 billion by 2024. And since India is much more uh, involved in bringing all the 5G technologies, this optical fibers, uh, they have an important role to play in that. Now, uh, by going through all those slides, we know that innovation merges, it gels well with the R&D department because uh, and India is a land of innovative minds and that has been truly uh, 
uh, and that has been truly marked well with the all the innovation that have taken place during the pandemic time and uh, if we talk about financial year 2021 the science and technology alone the sector alone added 1497501 employees becoming india's top employment generator and that is huge for a country having the unemployment problem now but using only 0.6% of the gdp uh, for r and d development in india is not going to do much well to the economic development for that instead we need to follow a closed economy cycle in which the scientific innovation should be in closed association with the market and that um, uh, with the close association with the market and that market should give us good economic gain and in turn that economic gain can again be used to be invested in the r and d department in order to boost the scientific innovation the budding scientific innovations everywhere and you know because innovation is all about imagining the future and filling the gaps thank you everyone um is there any questions thank you ma'am okay thank you thank you vidushi vidushi uh, vidushi nikki and uh, dr kanksha uh, regarding scientific innovation for economic growth uh, uh, again i would like to quote an example i am from uh, haryana punjab belt and uh, we grow rice since ages and i remember in the childhood when we used to plant paddy ourselves uh, they used to say this is pr6 we didn't know what is pr6 but we just knew that pr6 means rice so that paddy was called pr6 it was a short height plant and used to produce about 8 quintals of grain per acre which was not even sufficient for the farmer himself even if he had uh, if he had no less than 6 acres of land it was not sufficient for him to even uh, uh, manage his expenses and uh, later on as uh, science progressed uh, sometime in 2003 or 4 i heard 1121 this was called uh, called gyara 21 by farmers and this is pusa gyara 21 which is uh, a variety of rice developed by indian agricultural research institute and uh, uh, this uh, has a good height is resistant to uh, so many uh, pests and also uh, to the weather conditions and the production is three times it is about 24 25 quintal now and uh, even if a farmer has 3 4 acres of land he can not only sustain he can also get it harvested by all instruments and still have sufficient for him the production is three times that is how science has contributed to economic growth and uh, uh, coming to the next presentation we have just last two uh, this one is by akanksha and sasidhar on action for curtailing global warming and climate change uh, to be moderated by dr susanta kal uh, dr kal is uh, our colleague at cdri he is working in the area of molecular microbiology and immuno immunology its interests include uh, uh, deciphering of the cell signaling networks of innate and adaptive immunity associated with host parasite interactions dr ka what so a very good afternoon to all of you so i would like to welcome akanksha singh who is a ugc grf fellow working in the endocrinology division of cdri and her area of special uh, specialization is ovarian pathophysiology and shashidhar kalur who is a project associate in the same division in the endocrinology division and he is working on the diagnostic and therapeutic approach for infertility so today they are going to speak on the topic action for curtailing the global warming and climate changes now let's hear their innovative ideas to tackle the global warming and climate changes floor is yours hello thank you for introducing us sir 
A very good evening to one and all present here. Myself, Shashidhar. And myself, Akansha Singh. We are standing here to speak on the topic, Action for Curtailing Global Warming and Climate Change. Please play the video. We are all sitting here like literally uncomfortably because there is no AC. Let me just tell about what is that. The earth is getting warmer and warmer. It is because it's called global warming and it's a real thing. Factories, cars and pollution, these stuffs can increase the temperature of the world by about 2 to 3 degrees. And that could be deadly to many animals as well as humans. Global warming and climate change. These are the major problems in this world and they can immediate to attention before it's too late. And uh, when we look at uh, coral bleaching in Australia, Lizard Island, within the span of two months, my dear friends, the dumping of industrial waste directly into ocean has led to the bleaching. And when we look at uh, the glacial melt in Antarctica region, Greenland, we can see that the loss of ice has been melted. And that has led to increase in sea level and resulted in permanent climate change across the globe. And according to the philosophy, it is believed that we did not inherit this earth from our ancestors. Rather, we are taken it from our future generation at the time and place where we have polluted our entire world. So, this is the high time for us to work on a verb. That is, prevention is better than cure. Look, we have a other option or plans. If there is one fail, there is always plan B. But in this session, um, but, uh, but in this session uh, there is only one planet, there is no planet B. And when we look at uh, International Year for Basic Science and Sustainable Development, we have this uh, contribution of basic science that have led to uh, action against global warming and climate change. I would like to mainly focus on use of biofertilizers. Biofertilizers are like mainly used to convert infertile land into fertile land, wherein the uh, plant is uh, like developed or produced, and it is more nutritious in way. And use of electric vehicles, we have shifted from conventional vehicles, use of petrol and diesel, fossil fuels, to electric vehicles to reduce the carbon dioxide emission across the globe. And when we look at energy efficient houses, we all love to have a house where there is no power cut and live our lifestyle healthily. That can be achieved with the contribution of basic science. And when we look at preserving biodiversity, preserving please play the video. Preserving of biodiversity has led to the save the many living organisms. For example, removal of microplastic from water bodies, which can help, which can help to uh, increase the purity of water and life of aquatic animal. And other is afforestation. Afforestation is also the major content. It helps to converting the burn land into the fertile one, and which also help in converting the cultivation and which prevent the soil erosion. In this video. Uh, sorry, there is a technical problem in the video. Okay. In this video, in Africa, the burns are created and for the helping of the afforestation, which also help to uh, convert the uh, drought land into the vegetative land. And also the water harvesting. Water harvesting was the major concern, which increased the groundwater level and the same water can be used for the other purpose like irrigation. And we have also the other example. There is like water harvesting facilities at Ali Gan CSI scientist apartment. And when we look at economic growth, how it is impacting on global warming to fight against global warming actually. And uh, use of LED bulbs. The conventional bulbs used to produce a lot of carbon dioxide, but whereas LED bulbs and they are cost effective as well. And uh, one more thing I would like to bring is like switching off the light when not in use. In our lab, we have more than lights, like 50 lights in per lab and consider it like uh, refrigerators and other things. It is a lot of energy consumption. So when we put off light when it's not in use, then we can have an economically developed thing. And in case of uh, nutritious food at affordable cost, Government has planned many schemes uh, for uh, like, you know, uh, midday meal schemes and uh, producing, uh, giving less money and uh, giving more uh, amount of uh, grains to the below poverty level people. That shows that we are economically developing. And when we consider International Year for Basic Science and Sustainable Development Goals, According to the United Nations Assembly, these are the 17 goals. So everyone should need to work together to have a better future. Here are some of the examples of the sustainable development like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being and their climate action and other things to maintain the 
sustainable development in the world wide since morning we have been listening about global warming and climate change and preserving biodiversity different different sessions and into the action to reduce global warming and climate change we have planting trees and water harvesting are the basic things but what about new in it innovative things we have rooftop gardens in urban cities and all there is no land for cultivating forest areas what about rooftop gardens are the solution for it when you uh, can cultivate plants on your roof you will have a reduced temperature at your room and also you can cultivate vegetables using bio waste that is produced in your own house so a reduce reuse recycle completely explains about waste management and segregation as well and when we look at nanotechnology we also have the example of use of microplastic to convert uh, like you know reduce plastics from water bodies and uh, let me talk about plasma discharge system in singapore uh, the plasma discharge system is used majorly the waste is collected from every part of singapore and transferred to industry where they incinerate everything and they suspend the uh, smoke as well as water that they used to this plasma discharge system wherein it releases pure oxygen into the air as well as pure water into the water bodies wherein there is no harm for the environment as well as aquatic animals and when we look at uh, keep uh, like renewable energies keeping wide observation of the nature the renewable energy these are the key to for a sustainable future such as the hydro energy biomass energy geothermal energy tidal energy solar energy and also the wind energy. these are the major source of the renewable energy and which can reduce the global warming and climate change and uh, please play the video and i would like to bring an example that uh, uh, so again the video is not playing let me tell what is there in the video singapore is one of the greenest cities in the world it has more number of trees than the humans which are actually living there on an average these trees that they there reduce the global temperature by about 2 to 3 degrees celsius my dear friends 2 to 3 degrees celsius in this hot and humid country 2 to 3 degrees celsius make a big difference and when we look at uh, true human role models across the globe we have sir david ottenberg he is awarded champion of the earth in 2022 by united nation environment program he says that right now we are facing man made disaster of global scale our greatest threat in thousands of years climate change so when we see in india garvita john paul varad malaika and aditya these are the five young climate warrior and they fight against the different different issue which concern the environmental crisis and please meet the balbir singh his work against the water pollution in india we have padma shri awardi tulsi gowda she has an immense knowledge about medicinal plants as well as irrigation system and we also have salu mardati makka where she has dedicated most of her life to uh, like uh, cultivate or plant trees in her south southern part of uh, india and she says that trees are her own children which they help in future generation as well and we also can like you know have different environmental ngos worldwide where they fight against uh, different environmental uh, like animal poaching etc so be the change that you want to see in the world clean house leads to clean street clean streets leads to clean city clean cities forms clean country clean countries make better planet thank you anand all thank you akanksha and shashidhar and i believe i believe that we got the message that be the change you want to see in the world so if you have any question the from audience is there any question so if not then i will ask you a single question that uh, what do you think if we change our lifestyle that could impact on this global warming or that can improve the our this problem global warming or climate changes yes, changing sir. lifestyle uh, for example bicycle riding bicycle so uh, most of here people like bring two wheelers four wheelers to the office yes so when we use bicycle use of fossil fuel is less and carbon emission is also very less and you will be healthy what more you want so this small change can have a big impact nice answer like Thank pulling you. car when yes. you come to office yes sir okay shashidara yes our next presentation from bsip uh, two students i will i would like to welcome prachiti arora who who is a bsrs yeah. 
SRF fellow from BSIP Lucknow. Her work focuses on glacial geomorphology, paleoclimate reconstitution, reconstruction, and perception study in the higher Him Himalayan region. And Shirish Verma, who is a CSR JRF, works on late quaternary landscape evolution and climate variability of northwestern Himalayan. So their topic in action for curtailing global warming and climate change, the same topic. And the focus will be on individual efforts to curb climate changes and contribution of uh, paleobiologists as well as the BSIP towards this effort. Stage. Thank you so much, sir, for the introduction. Am I audible to you people? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank uh, INSA Lucknow chapter convener for giving us the opportunity to speak on this platform. So uh, we are going to speak on the impact of uh, uh, curtailing the impact of climate change and global warming as uh, I, I believe the previous speakers have covered it uh, very beautifully so so we are going to focus here as uh, what we as a, as a paleo climate climatologist how we are going to curtail the impact of um, this climate change and the global warming so uh, we we see uh, in our day to day uh, life that climate change it, climate change is uh, basically one of the pressing issue of uh, uh, of the time of the decades, uh, so we see um, how climate uh, climate change is being. We see we read it in uh, our day to day life in a uh, newspaper how it is being uh, how uh, how the uh, polar ice sheets are being uh, melted the time how the sea level is changing how we see we read in a newspaper how this um, uh, coastal com community would have to shift from. Uh, uh, from their place to the interior of the continent if if the present rate of climate change continues so uh, it's a basically uh, it's basically uh, the uh, why so, so here the question comes why this climate change is happening it's just because of the uh, global warming there are and uh, global warming is one of the component which are causing this climate change to happen and uh, we uh, we can uh, we can see uh, we, uh, so here question comes why these uh, glaciers are melting why 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 these uh, sea levels are increasing so it's uh, it's just because key surface uh, our surface term, global surface temperature temperature is increasing so which led to the melting of the glaciers which ultimately increases the flux in the oceans and which led to the sea increase in the sea level and so on, so on and so forth so here here we have a graph which which is showing the different climatic data sets which are which are taking the the average uh, global surface uh, temperature since uh, 1850 to 2019. So uh, they are, uh, I mean, all the data sets are more or less in the best fit, and they are showing that yes, it is increasing global surface temperature. It is increasing. So what are the factors which are responsible for such uh, such climate change and such uh, increase in the global uh, global uh, surface temperature? So, uh, in in one word, we can describe it. It's the energy imbalances, which are which are which can be caused by the two processes. That could be natural processes or or by the human activities. So, the natural processes includes the volcanic activities. We we have uh, we have uh, uh, volcanic eruption volcanic eruptions both at the uh, continent both in uh, over the continents and in the uh, inside the ocean. So, it, this volcanic eruption in, in releases a lot of harmful gases, which ultimately led to the warming warming of the atmosphere and the surfaces second second uh, most important natural process is the tectonic uh, plate movement yeah we know that the uh, this tectonic uh, plate moves from one place to another with time so it uh, at, uh, so they sometimes they collided with each other led to the formation of mighty himalayas like things or mountain mountain belt or sometimes they uh, move away from one another which again led to the uh, led to the rise of the uh, uh, magma to the surface in the form of the lava which again releases a lot of harmful gases in the atmosphere and in the atmosphere and which ultimately increases the global uh, global surface temperature so changes in the uh, changes in the sun yeah with 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 time we it's been it's been observed that the uh, the sun's activity sun's spots uh, is changing which 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 are which are which are causing changes in the sun's illumination uh, or uh, the intensity of the sunlight which is being uh, being received by the uh, received by the earth it changes with the uh, with with time uh, so uh, at the last fourth one is the uh, uh, natural processes includes the shift in the earth's orbit so uh, we we know that earth is rotating on its axis and as well as it is revolving around the sun so this axis, uh, this axis of rotation and this uh, the revolution of the Earth around the Sun changes with time, which is being explained beautifully by the Milankovitch cycle. 
so we know we know it ki uh, earth revolves around the sun and this uh, today we have a el elliptical path uh, in the horizontal in the horizontal uh, way uh, at at some point of time, time in the in the past in the geological past we have had the Uh, revolution of the earth in in the in the circular manner so it changes with the time so when when it, when the earth is at the position where it receives the most sunlight so we we have a different climatic condition and when it is uh, farther uh, to, uh, from the sun we have different climate uh, uh, different uh, climatic regime so so coming to the human activities yeah we know we we are uh, i mean this air pollution we are polluting uh, this we can see in the photograph yeah vehicle, vehicular emission carbon dioxide coal uh, deforestation uh, deforestation and a number of causes which uh, which is already been covered by our previous speaker so i would not take much time here so what we can do here uh, in uh, uh, i mean these are some of the basic things uh, we need to we need to as as a um, as a human being we need to we need to follow this we need to adopt this we need to follow it with all the discipline because we know we know the uh, i mean single drops of water if we collect from everyone it would be capable enough to uh, fill fill a pond or lake so so we can we can we can follow these things uh, we cannot uh, we should not waste electricity as my friend said ki we can we can come to the office uh, by by skill or by uh, not by the ca car every time or we can uh, do odd even things like that uh, this these are the uh, some of the things we we can do on our uh, on an, our personal level so if yeah if we wanna see the change in the change uh, in others uh, we 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 need to start from ourselves our home from our institute so uh, these were the uh, these were the some of the uh, basic uh, things uh, what we can do to curtail the glo uh, global warming so here here comes the uh, role uh, how how a paleo sciences is being uh, is uh, being uh, uh, helpful in curtailing the uh, climate change or the global warming so uh, we know that india is an agri agrarian economy where the 70 almost 70% of the people rely on the agriculture for their livelihood and agriculture is related with the Uh, agriculture needs uh, uh, the irrigation uh, and the water for the irrigation is being uh, supplied by the indian summer monsoons so we we know that 80% of the agricultural uh, irrigation water to the agricultural lands of the indian subcontinent are from the indian summer monsoon and uh, what factors then the question comes what factors governs the indian summer monsoon indian summer mo uh, uh, indian summer monsoon being governed by the uh, southwestern trade winds we know that and the southwestern trade winds brings lot of moisture from the uh, from the arabian sea to the uh, indian uh, indian subcontinent so uh, basically uh, what happens why why this wind uh, flows from one place to another is just because of the uh, pressure belt which is being created why this pressure belt is being created just because of the differential heating of the uh, 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 differential heating of the land and the ocean and why how how this differential heating is happening is just because of the solar insulation so we see that how the how the sun is uh, impacting the indian summer monsoon and how this indian summer monsoon cha changes the climatic pattern and how it it's going to impact impact the impact the human beings so so to uh, decipher this uh, we do lot of reconstruction of the paleo climatic studies that would be taken forward by the prachita monsoon has a tendency of its notorious variability on uh, centennial and decadal time scales so we as an institution what we do is we try to reconstruct that monsoon using different different proxies and the, these monsoon these monsoon reconstructions from the past will help us in modulating help us in creating the models for future the models will not only help in understanding the variability of the climate but also will help in um, uh, establishing adaptive adaptive strategies to model the climate of the future relatively long term historical and ancient monsoon data is required bsip scientists are working hard to develop a paleo approach to forecast future monsoons using data from past records furthermore BSIP scientists are conducting cutting edge research on the interactions between biotic and abiotic factors in various ecosystems as well as effects of anthropogenic stress on regional and global climate change the overarching goal of such studies is to make a society that is aware and resilient to climate change further the institute has also delved into climate perception studies through climate dependent variables especially in difficult terrains like himalayas in himalayas what happens is 
in a very small spatial gradient the temperature and the climate vary drastically so and it is not always feasible to install these meteorological stations on such difficult terrains so what we do is sometimes to understand the temperature and precipitation at a local scale we are using climate perception studies that is taking the opinions from the locals and from the indigenous people harnessing their knowledge and filling the gaps in this meteorological data the himalayan ecosystem has been reported to be the worst damaged by the climate change and the populations living in such regions are more vulnerable to its effects it has been reported that the himalayas compared to the other indian compared to the indian subcontinent the himalayas have suffered a more drastic uh, increase in the climate change about 1.5 degree celsius the climate has warmed so uh, the the perception studies that we have done the results of that show that the uh, climate change the people's perception of climate change correlates well with the scientific data and its impact shows negative consequences on the local environment and traditional lifestyles by these perception studies we also were able to understand the, the different adaptive strategies of different people for example my work is on sikkim so i went to sikkim i spoke with the people i interacted with them and i saw that how they are uh, sort of responding and adapting to climate change so the people there are extremely aware of climate change and they have banned plastic bottles they put fines they are very aware they are they have bamboo bottles these days now i went to lachin and lachung and saw bamboo bottles being sold in the shops for the tourists so that they don't bring their bottles and uh, destroy the ecosystem apart from that there is a sort of a controlled tourism because sikkim my audible yeah sikkim is a tourist hotspot so they are trying to minimize the tourism as well because tourism even though it, it is increasing the economy it is really having harmful effects on the climate and the whole ecosystem thank you any questions i would answer yes please yeah please uh, we can uh, we can uh, rely on the uh, i mean renewable energy resources uh, in order to uh, reduce the emission of the harmful gases uh, to counter the uh, global warming Uh, for instance, for instance, ki uh, uh, I would like to I would like to tell you one uh, case study. Uh, when we were in uh, MSc MSc time in BHU, we we saw that uh, in every hostels in the terrace of every hostels, this uh, large solar uh, solar panels are being installed in order to uh, in increase the self reliance of the uh, whole university. So we can we can we can adopt this uh, this uh, this kind of approach and although. the various uh, government schemes are there where government is providing lot of subsidies uh, so you can install install the solar panel at your house up to 5 kv which is capable enough of uh, uh, running ac acs and all all the laser stuffs so we can we can we can rely on the renewable energy resources uh, like solar panel we can afford it and uh, i mean i i won't suggest ki uh, uh, thermal or, or either geothermal thing we can afford as a as a human being or as a layman so yeah uh, by adopting these things we can we can uh, re definitely reduce the impact of yeah, global warming thank you shirishan yeah. prachita so i would like to express yeah, big, big. okay okay there is another question for Okay. I studied geography, okay. and I learned that Indian weather is controlled by two forces: one is military and second is satellite. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said na ki uh, uh, pressure gradient, which plays a uh, very important role. So when when uh, this southwestern trade wind comes na, it Tibetan plateau has a very high pressure, and this. Uh, yeah. so indian subcontinent has low pressure so those uh, southwestern trade wind which moves right from the equator just because of the coriolis force it goes towards the indian monsoon if that uh, pressure in the tibet uh, the tibetan plateau would not be there we would not be having the southwestern trade wind and we would not be having the indian summer monsoon yeah no 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 
we we are mainly majorly fo- focusing on the northwestern himalaya part trans himalaya uh, we go up to the uh, kargil uh, kargil and uh, here uh, towards the northeastern side uh, we cover entire central uh, central india himachal pradesh and uh, himachal pradesh and uttarakhand uh, we work there or uh, we we goes up to the uh, sikkim himalayas towards ha uh, basically the indian parts of the himalayas Yeah. Yeah. It goes. It goes towards north. Uh, basically, uh, you are talking about the ITC that zone which is being formed at the equator. When uh, when it when when it's when, when I am telling you know when it's uh, what 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 I know uh, what I can understand from your question. Okay. Uh, when it's the Indian summer monsoon time, it uh, pushes uh, slightly towards the north. Yes. Okay. Just because of coralist force. I mean, coralist force. Uh, uh, it's a force uh, when the winds uh, moves from equator equator towards north pole. Uh, just because of the coralist force, the winds move towards right. And in the southern hemisphere, winds move towards the left. So that's why it's bent towards the Indian summer, uh, Indian Indian subcontinent. Impact of I, I I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Because such kind of bends in waves have not been seen in other parts of the world. No, no, no. It's it's a uniform, sir. It's uniform. It's everywhere. Wherever uh, wherever wind from equator moves towards the North Pole, it bends towards the right. It's it's uh, just because of the coralless force. And in the southern hemisphere, it moves towards the left just because of the coralless force. Okay, thank you, Sirishan Prachita. I would so like much. to so express much. my thanks to all of you who have presented today for their valuable contribution to the INSA Symposium. So, Rajender, up to you. What do you do for better climate? That is the right question we should be asking, and we must ask it at least today. What do we do? So uh, I'll, I'll just quote one or two small examples, just two minutes. Say, uh, we see in our neighborhood what people do is they open their water pipes and they are simply watering the tarmac or the concrete in front of their houses. Why? Just because I have access to this water, nobody is there to ask me and they do not bill me. No, I am free. Then in the morning, you would see somebody taking out car and then washing it, drenching it properly. You can just do it with half a bucket of water by taking a cloth. You can clean your car very well. No, it is my car. I have to clean it thoroughly. Mm, I should use as much water as I can. Mm. And with regard to light, as uh, Sasidhar was asking, what we can do. So in the laboratory and in office, we should try to switch off the lights uh, whenever they are not in use. We should switch them off. Like I see here, uh, I remember uh, I was taking exercise in our gymnasium at CDRI. Two girls came who never came to the gym. They came and they switched on all the lights. Hmm? I just went on and asked them, please tell me, what do you want to see? Huh? What is there in gym to see? Hmm? There is enough light here or you can open the door. So we do not apply these things. So what are we achieving by doing all that? But anyway, uh, by doing what we did today, we achieved a lot. And uh, uh, we have made it a point that Lucknowites are doing their best. In fact, they have done their best uh, uh, towards sustainable development by uh, making this symposium a success. We talked about health and well-being, water and sanitation, preserving biodiversity, economic growth, and uh, uh, for better climate and avoiding global warming. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, particularly to the budding scientists. This has not only helped us in achieving what we have achieved today, but will also add to your skills uh, for the future. And uh, thank you all the participants uh, uh, for sparing your day out of your busy schedule. And thank you very much. I would like to call upon uh, uh, Dr. Saman Habib for felicitating and encouraging our young scientists. Thank you, Rajinder, for uh, coordinating this session so wonderfully. Uh, I'm really grateful to all the young participants, research scholars who came from 
you know, our sister brother research institutes in the city. I think it's the first time I've seen BSIP students in this institute. So welcome, guys. We are not restricted to CSIR. DST labs are also welcome. <laughs> so uh, I would like to acknowledge your participation by just giving out participation certificates. These are not certificates that mean anything. But we just like to acknowledge the fact that you participated so wholeheartedly and made an effort to make such wonderful presentations to us today. Uh, so Anuradha and Tuba from CDRI first. Please come up, followed by Anuradha and Deepshi. Give them a big hand, guys. Anuradha Seth and Tuba Kamal. Then we have Anuradha Singh and Deepshi Chaurasia from IITR. Rudra Banerjee and Sanchita Singh from NBRI. Vidushi Tyagi and Nikki Deepa from CMAP. And from CDRI, Akanksha Singh and Shashidhar Kolur. and Prachita Arora and Shirish Varma from BSIP. Thank you everyone for being here, but don't leave without a cup of tea outside. So there's some tea waiting for you. Join us there. And I would like to end by thanking everybody who found time to come for this symposium. We are all going back after having learned at least something that was new to us. And I hope this whole discussion on climate change and sustainable goals will leave an impact on our minds and we'll be careful about the things we do and the kind of work we do also in the future as scientists. I would also like to end by thanking our audiovisual team. Thank you very much, Arbind and team, for taking care of everything so beautifully. Thank you all.